Now a hearing examines problems with trailers provided by FEMA to hurricane victims. Witnesses include the CEOs of several companies that manufactured the trailers. A study by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention found potentially dangerous levels of the chemical formaldehyde. Henry Waxman chairs this oversight committee, which is just under four hours. The committee will please come to order. Today the committee is holding its second hearing on formaldehyde in FEMA trailers. A year ago, the committee examined how FEMA responded to reports that the families living in government trailers were being exposed to hazardous levels of formaldehyde. Our hearing revealed that the FEMA staff out in the field said that they needed to test these trailers so the dangerous levels of formaldehyde would not adversely affect the families living in these trailers. But FEMA itself in Washington refused to do that. One FEMA lawyer directed, do not initiate any testing. Once you get results, and should they indicate some problem, the clock is running on our duty to respond. Well, what we learned at that hearing out outraged Americans all across the country. FEMA had a duty to protect families living in its trailers, and it failed them. I expect today's hearing will also generate a sense of outrage. The largest supplier, supplier of FEMA trailers by far was a manufacturer named Gulfstream. In the weeks after Hurricane Katrina struck, Gulfstream received contracts from FEMA worth more than $500 million to supply over 50,000 trailers for displaced residents of the Gulf Coast. FEMA failed by ignoring the dangers of formaldehyde and resisted testing. Gulfstream's problem is different. The company did test trailers. After hearing the first reports of high formaldehyde levels, it found pervasive formaldehyde contamination in its trailers, and it didn't tell anyone. The committee received thousands of pages of internal documents from Gulfstream. The documents show that Gulfstream regarded the high levels of formaldehyde in its trailers as a public relations and legal problem, not a public health threat. There is a confusing array of formaldehyde standards used by federal agencies. Here are some of the key numbers. 10 to 30 parts per billion is the level of formaldehyde found in most homes. Exposure at this level does not cause acute health effects like burning in the eyes or shortness of breath or nausea. 100 parts per billion is the level at which acute health effects begin to appear in healthy adults. The Centers for Disease Control, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Consumer Product Safety Commission, the National Institute of Occupational, uh, um, NIOSH, National Occupation of Health, and the World Health Organization all recognize 100 parts per billion as a level that can cause acute adverse health effects. Uh, of course, if it's a vulnerable individual like a child or an elderly person or somebody who's chronically ill, they can experience effects even below this level. 500 parts per billion is the level at which OSHA requires medical monitoring of employees. This is an old standard dating back to the first Bush administration. 750 parts per billion is the maximum workplace exposure level allowed by OSHA. It's also an old standard. 900 parts per billion is an EPA standard for hazardous response teams or industrial workers. EPA says that no one should be exposed to more than 900 parts per billion for more than eight hours in a lifetime. And here's what Gulfstream found. Over two years ago, it tested 11 occupied trailers. Every single trailer had levels at or above 100 parts per billion, the level at which acute health effects begin to occur. Four of the trailers had levels above 500 parts per billion, the level at which OSHA requires medical monitoring. Gulfstream also tested nearly 40 unoccupied trailers. These were trailers that were sitting in FEMA lots waiting to be given to displaced families. Over half of these trailers 
had formaldehyde levels above 900 parts per billion, the level that EPA says no one should ever be exposed to, to more than once in a lifetime. Several had levels over 2,000 parts per billion. One had levels over 4,000 parts per billion. Gulfstream never told any family living in its trailers about these test results. The company did spend a month carefully crafting a letter to FEMA about the test results. The letter told FEMA there was no problem in Gulfstream trailers. It said, quote, our informal testing has indicated that formaldehyde levels of indoor ambient air of occupied trailers fall below the OSHA standard of 750 parts per billion. Gulfstream did not tell FEMA that all 11 occupied trailers had levels above 100 parts per billion. It did not tell FEMA that four of the 11 occupied trailers had levels above 500 parts per billion. And it did not tell FEMA that over half of the unoccupied trailers had levels far in excess of 750 parts per billion. Gulfstream did say that it would share its testing results with FEMA. But of course, FEMA didn't want to know and apparently never asked for those results. The press asked Gulfstream about its formaldehyde levels. Gulfstream retained a Washington public relations firm, Porter Novelli, and spent days crafting a statement. The statement read, quote, we are not aware of any complaints of illness from our many customers of travel trailers over the years, including travel trailers provided under our contracts with FEMA, end quote. Gulfstream did not tell the media that in March 2006, a month before Gulfstream released its statement, an occupant of a Gulfstream trailer in Louisiana told the company, quote, there is an odor in my trailer in Louisiana uh, that will not go away. It burns my eyes. I am getting headaches every day. I have tried many things, but nothing seems to work. Please, please, please help me. The FEMA contract was uh, lucrative for Gulfstream. In fact, the company's top executives saw their compensation double to over a million dollars per year in 2005 and 2006. But revenue growth does not justify the conduct we have found. Gulfstream had results that showed its trailers were a public health threat, and the company never told the families living in its trailers. The company also examined the conduct of the uh, th uh, three other trailer manufacturers. One of the companies, Pilgrim, apparently took the FEMA approach. Despite widely publicized reports of dangerous formaldehyde levels in FEMA trailers, Pilgrim never conducted any testing at all. The other two companies, Forest River and Keystone, did not test any trailer purchased by FEMA, but they did do some limited testing of other trailers and found high levels. In one case, a contractor hired by Forest River reported finding formaldehyde levels of over 1,500 parts per billion in a trailer. The contractor told the company it should post signs on the outside of the unit stating hazardous, do not enter. And like Gulfstream, these manufacturers did not tell the public or F FEMA about their test results. My staff has prepared an analysis of the evidence before the committee, and at the appropriate time, I'll ask that the analysis and the documents it cites be made part of the hearing record. What this hearing will show is that no one was looking out for the interests of the displaced families living in FEMA trailers. FEMA failed to do its job, and the trailer manufacturers took advantage of the situation. Our committee has held many hearings on waste, fraud, and abuse. In one sense, today's hearing can be looked at as another example of government procurement gone astray. The taxpayers paid $2 billion for trailers that now have to be scrapped for junk. But in this case, the health of thousands of vulnerable families was jeopardized. During today's hearing, the trailer manufacturers will be asked hard questions, and I think they understand this. But I also want them to know that I appreciate their cooperation with the committee and their willingness to appear voluntarily.
Uh, I'd like to ask unanimous consent that the uh, uh, staff report trailer manufacturers and elevated uh, formaldehyde levels. Mr. Chairman, we would also ask unanimous consent that the minority staff analysis uh, be put into the record as well. Uh, we have no objection to your unanimous consent we request. No and let me further ours that uh, we want uh, the documents as well that the report uh, refers to made part of the Mr. record. Mr. Chairman, I have a concern about the documents that were uh, and would object to uh, the documents all being ins inserted that were uh, provided to the committee without having a further discussion about whether all those documents need to be released, that many of them contain private information? Well, we'll, with, we'll withhold the, all the unanimous consent requests and, uh, and then see if we can offer it at a later time. And Mr. Davis, I want to recognize you well, for an open Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As the third anniversary of Hurricane Katrina's landfall approaches, we have the opportunity to focus oversight attention on disaster preparedness and effective response. Katrina still has important lessons to teach about emergency shelter and longer-term housing for disaster victims. The Committee's two-year investigation into formaldehyde and FEMA travel trailers could yield important information about the need for clearer purchase requirements, um, better product safety standards, effective trailer storage practices, and a more rapid, coordinated response to public health issues. But by narrowly focusing today on four trailer manufacturers, the Committee risks missing the broader causes of variable, potentially toxic air quality in emergency housing units. The problem was and remains confusion among Federal agencies, not some conspiracy by trailer makers. As we learned from testimony and exhibits at our hearing on these issues a year ago, FEMA lawyers advised against a proactive response to questions about formaldehyde raised by the occupants and by the trader vendors in 2006. To this day, far more confusion than clarity emerges from any discussion of relevant formaldehyde exposure standards. Published guidelines on exposures under various circumstances, durations, temperatures, and atmospheric conditions range from 8 parts per billion to 1,000 parts per billion with nine standards in between. And this chart here, I think, illustrates that. For the record, Gulfstream went to FEMA for guidance when they uncovered problems. They didn't cover it up from their customer. They went to the customer. It is FEMA that said, uh, th who is not here today, unfortunately, and ought to be answerable for the results in this case uh, that didn't want to make an issue of this. The closest thing to a standard for travel trailers is one set for larger manufactured housing units by the Department of Housing and Urban Development at 400 parts per billion. There isn't even agreement on the appropriately validated testing methodologies to determine how to measure indoor formaldehyde levels that might be elevated above whatever standard is being used. But the Federal agency witnesses who might help explain this formaldehyde tower babble aren't here today. FEMA is focusing all its attention on Midwest flood relief. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration, the Environmental Protection Agency, the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, the Consumer Product Safety Commission, and HUD also have information relevant to our discussion this morning. But they were only invited to participate late last Thursday as Federal offices were closing for the holiday weekend. They declined to participate without more time to prepare. We should have actually taken this hearing and moved it so we could have had, I think, everyone involved here and had a really discussion over what these standards should have been and what happened and hear how the Federal Government, who I think has the largest culpability in this, uh, messed this up. That is unfortunate because those agencies could help us interpret results from multiple government sponsored tests of occupied and, uh, and unoccupied FEMA trailers and component materials. The test data suggests some wood products obtained from new sources, including China, yielded higher than expected formaldehyde readings. Under pressure to meet emergency trailer production demand, some of that wood may have been put into trailers before the normal off-gassing could occur. Poor ventilation during storage and use, particularly in hot climates, then trapped and concentrated gases that might otherwise leach off harmlessly. So what happens to a trailer after it is manufactured may have as much to do with its subsequent safety as the inclusion of unregulated wood products in the first place. Remember, formaldehyde is a widely used chemical in consumer products. It is also the natural byproduct of many natural processes like combustion and a constant element of basic metabolic, fun uh, metabolic functions. It is in our bloodstream. Each of us releases some formaldehyde in this room when we exhale. Eliminating formaldehyde isn't the issue. 
The goal is to keep sustained formaldehyde exposure below the level suspected to cause health effects. According to some groups, that may be 100 parts per billion or less for most people. So where did FEMA trailer score? According to data recently released by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the average letter level of formaldehyde in occupied trailers fell between 72 and 91 parts per billion. 72 and 91. Our staff did some random tests around the Capitol with a handheld meter, and we got a reading of 80 parts per billion right next to this committee anteroom. But some traders tested much higher, some lower. Since the CDC tests didn't account for any contribution from background levels like those we found here, it is even less clear how much formaldehyde came from the wood in the trailers. That leaves trailer occupants, already victimized by one storm, caught in a lingering tempest of post-Katrina political scapegoating, bureaucratic finger-pointing, and litigation. Once again, the committee risks being used as a discovery proxy for plaintiffs suing companies called to testify before us, and that is wrong. Instead, we should be asking FEMA why contract requirements for habitable uh, mobile units weren't more specific, why inspection pr uh, procedures weren't consistent, and why health concerns didn't trigger standardized testing and, where necessary, prompt remediation. We should be asking Federal science and health agencies how to establish and measure workable standards for formaldehyde exposure in realistic settings so that this sad event never occurs again. We will have the opportunity today to ask representatives of the travel trailer industry whether they will be able or willing to ramp up production to meet emergency demand when FEMA calls again. I hope their answer doesn't mean we will have even fewer options to meet critical housing needs after the next inevitable disaster. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, let me ask unanimous consent that Representative Donnelly and Lamson be uh, permitted to join us at today's hearing and to ask questions after all members of the uh, a committee have had that opportunity. And without objection, uh, that will be the order. And uh, uh, Mr. Souter, uh, you uh, had some reservations about the documents being put into the record. Let me just make a unanimous cons consent request that the uh, staff minority and majority reports be made part of the record, and we will continue to talk to you about the documents to see Thank what parts of those. Thank you for your consideration. Are. Without objection, uh, that unanimous consent will be agreed to. Uh, we will, uh, and, uh, w without objection on questions, proceed with uh, our first witness uh, with ten minute rounds, ten, a ten-minute round controlled by the chair, a a and a ten-minute round controlled by the ranking member. And then, for all other witnesses, including the second panel, we will go back to the five-minute rule. And without objection, uh, that will be agreed to. Our uh, first witness today is Dr. Michael McKeon. Dr. McKeon is the Director of Environmental Hazards and Health Effects, Division of National Center for Environmental Health within CDC. Dr. McKeon has worked with CDC for nearly 30 years, focusing on issues related to environmental health. Uh, Dr. McKeon, we are pleased to welcome you to our committee hearing today. It is the practice of this committee that all witnesses that testify before us do so under oath, so if you please rise. Do you uh, solemnly swear the testimony you will give before the committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. The record will indicate that the witness answered in the affirmative. Your prepared statement will be in the record in its entirety. We would like to ask you to proceed and uh, uh, stay as close to five minutes as, as you can. We will run the clock. It will be green uh, for four minutes. It will turn uh, orange. Uh, for one minute and then red when the time is up. And when you see the red light, we would like to ask you to see if you could conclude at that point. There is a button on the base of the mic. Be sure it is pressed on so that uh, we will be able to hear you. Good morning, Chairman Waxman, Mr. Davis, and other distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I am Dr. Michael McGeehan, Director of Centers for Disease Control Prevention's Division of Environmental Hazards and Health Effects in the National Center for Environmental Health. My testimony today will focus on the results of CDC investigations related to FEMA supplied temporary housing units following Hurricane Katrina. It will focus on two particular studies, the final report of the formaldehyde levels in FEMA supplied travel trailers and the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory interim volatile organic compound report. Final occupied trailer study. From December 21st, 2007 to January 23rd, 2008, 
CDC conducted testing to assess levels of formaldehyde in occupied FEMA supplied travel trailers and mobile homes in Louisiana and Mississippi. CDC randomly selected 519 trailers and mobile homes for testing. These units represented a cross section of the trailer types and manufacturers most frequently used by FEMA in the Gulf Coast. Interim results were announced in February 2008 and a final report was released just on July 2nd. The final report included additional analyses of data such as temperature, humidity and ventilation, but did not change the conclusions or recommendations from those in the interim report. The average levels of formaldehyde in all the travel trailers and mobile homes tested was 77 parts per billion. CDC concluded from the study that, one, formaldehyde levels found in some trailers and mobile homes could affect the health of residents. Travel trailers had significantly higher average formaldehyde levels than mobile homes. Temperature, humidity, trailer type and brand, keeping windows open, and the presence of mold were associated with formaldehyde levels. And the levels measured likely underrepresented the exposure since levels were likely higher when the trailers were first issued and during warmer months. CDC recommended that FEMA relocate residents before the weather became hot with priority based on those experiencing symptoms, children, the elderly, those with chronic diseases, and persons living in trailer types that had higher formaldehyde levels. The Lawrence Berkeley Report. CDC hired Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories to study indoor emissions of volatile organic compounds, including formaldehyde, in four vacant FEMA supplied travel trailers. The study looked at air levels for the whole trailer and at gases released from specific component parts of the trailers, such as the walls, floors, ceilings, tables and cabinets. After Lawrence Berkeley and CDC took measurements of air inside the trailers at FEMA's Purvis, Mississippi storage yard, CDC staff then took each trailer apart, collected, packaged and shipped the parts to Lawrence Berkeley National Labs where laboratory staff tested the parts in small chambers to determine the type and extent of VOCs that each part emitted. The four trailers tested were Pilgrim International, Gulfstream Coach Cavalier, Thor Industries Dutchman, and Coachman Spirit of America. The analysis at the LBNL labs found 33 VOCs, volatile organic compounds, in the air of the trailers. Of those, only formaldehyde, phenol, and TMPD-DIB, a substance used to make plastic, were found at higher levels in trailers than commonly found in site-built or manufactured homes. Neither phenol nor TMPD DIB were found, DIP were found at levels that are consi considered to be health hazards. LBNL found that the amount of formaldehyde given off by each of 44 of the 45 component parts that were tested were usually no higher, higher than that given off by similar materials used in site-built or manufactured homes. Yet measurements inside each of the four trailers before they were disassembled revealed formaldehyde levels that were higher than those normally found in site-built or manufactured homes. This may be because the trailers use more composite wood products, have more composite wood products in a smaller space, or let in fresh air or a combination of all these factors than do site-built or manufactured homes. Although the results from this study cannot be generalized to the entire fleet of FEMA-supplied travel trailers because of the small sample size, CDC's study of four travel trailers provide information to help guide future research to understand the effectiveness of using materials that emit lower levels of formaldehyde during construction and increasing the ventilation rates in the trailers. That is a summary of the two major uh, studies that we have done. We have ongoing work uh, and some future work that we'll be doing that, uh, with uh, Lawrence Berkeley that I'll be happy to talk about during the questions. Um, I thank you for the opportunity to present this information to you today. We recognize that more needs to be done to understand the health and safety issues for all the people living in trailers and parks and mobile homes, both in FEMA temporary housing and in other units bought commercially. CDC has initiated discussions with FEMA and HUD on these issues. Since some trailer types had relatively low levels, we believe that construction practices are available that could assure safe and healthy conditions. We hope to provide technical input to help achieve that kind of housing for all Americans who live, learn and work in these units. I'd be happy to answer any questions. I'd like to add, Mr. Chairman, that when I flew up here, I flew up with your colleague, Dr. John Lewis, in the, I mean, Congressman John Lewis in the seat next to me, and I told him that I was going to be appearing before this committee, and he said, well, that's good. And I said, well, perhaps. And he said, I'm sure they'll treat you kindly. So I kind of considered that a promise. <laughs> well, it's our intention to treat you uh, kindly, because all we want to do is get the facts. I'll start off the questions. Uh, Dr. McGeehan, 
I want to ask you about these regulatory standards because there are a lot of different standards that are out there that apply to formaldehyde. According to the Centers uh, on Disease Control and Prevention, outside air typically has formaldehyde levels of two or three parts per billion. Is that right? That's what the that's what the information shows. Yes, sir. Okay. And uh, we have a chart that uh, we're going to put on the screen. That. Uh, that uh, that uh, shows the uh, the out uh, current outdoor airs, but conventional homes, most homes, have formaldehyde levels that typically range from 10 to 30 parts per billion. Is that in the, correct? In the more recent studies, yes, sir. Okay, and we can add that to the chart. Uh, busy city streets uh, generally have formaldehyde levels that range from 20 to 40 parts per billion. Is that right? If you are downtown on a corner and you basically are at gridlock, you can see those sorts of levels. Okay. Yes, sir. The next level I want to ask you about is 100 parts per billion. At this level, some people can suffer acute health effects like burning eyes, shortness of breath, and nausea. Is that an accurate statement? Yes, sir. There's a number of studies that have shown that sensitized individuals have those symptoms, can have those symptoms at, at levels of 100 parts per billion. How about people who are not sensitized? Um, the, the data, the, the studies show that sensitized individuals can, non-sensitized individuals can have those symptoms. I mean, it's possible that they could have symptoms at that level, although that's not what the studies have shown. That would be at higher levels. Okay. Um, CDC is not the only agency that regards 100 parts per billion as a potentially dangerous level. The Environmental Protection Agency and the Consumer Product Safety Commission have also identified 100 parts per billion as a level at which negative health effects can occur. And the World Health Organization has also issued guidelines for formaldehyde saying that in non-occupational settings, people should not be exposed to formaldehyde at 100 parts per billion for more than 30 minutes. Isn't that correct? That's true, sir. Now, I want to ask you about the test results that Gulfstream found over two years ago when it tested nearly 50 FEMA trailers. Gulfstream was the largest supplier of FEMA trailers. In fact, they received a contract worth more than $500 million to provide 50,000 trailers to FEMA. First, Gulfstream tested 11 occupied trailers, and it found that every occupied tra trailer had levels above 100 parts per billion. Four of the trailers, nearly 40 percent of those tested, had levels above 500 parts per billion. At that level, federal regulations require medical monitoring of workers. Dr. McKeon, were you aware of these findings? Uh, no, sir, I was not. Okay. As a public health expert, do these findings concern you? Uh, should families be living in trailers with formaldehyde levels above 100 and 500 parts per billion? Sir, we, we would recommend that families living in, in trailers with above 100 parts per billion and 500 parts per billion, that they be all offered alternative housing. Uh, Gulfstream conducted this testing in March of 2006, more than two years ago, and yet the company never told the families living in these trailers. Do you think that families should have been informed about formaldehyde risks? S sir, I think that, that uh, people should be aware of the risks that, of, of where they're living. Yes, I, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer that we should, that people should be aware of, the, of any information that we have that could affect their health. If you were living in one of these trailers for two years after the company knew that it might have been formaldehyde levels of over 100 or maybe 500 uh, parts per billion, what would your reaction be if they hadn't told you about it? As, as a scientist or as a resident? <laughs> well, give me either one. Uh, well, sir, I would, I would think that if, if we have information that people may be exposed to levels of formaldehyde, that may cause symptoms in sensitized adults and may have an effect on children who are growing up in the, in the environment, that we should share that with the residents. And I think that it should be shared in a way that they understand what we're talking about and so they can make an informed decision. Okay. Gulfstream also tested unoccupied trailers. The levels it found were even higher. Nearly half of the trailers had levels over 900 parts per billion. EPA says that no one should be exposed to that level more than once in a lifetime. One trailer had levels above 4,000 parts per billion. Uh, do you believe that these are dangerous levels of formaldehyde? I think at some of those levels, sir, um, just about every person would have symptoms of upper respiratory irritation. Um, 
And those would be levels that we would be concerned about, yes. Well, Gulfstream never told FEMA that the unoccupied trailers had such high levels of formaldehyde. The result was that FEMA continued to put these trailers into service. Thousands of unoccupied Gulfstream uh, trailers were given to families after Gulfstream knew they contained these incredibly high levels of formaldehyde. Now, I, I suppose once they're occupied, they can open the windows and the formaldehyde levels would be reduced. But given their findings, uh, would that concern you that FEMA was never informed? The families weren't informed? FEMA was never informed? Again, sir, I'd have to go back to what I had said earlier. I think that if we have information that may affect people's health, that we should share that information with, with the people. Um, I don't know what the correspondence was that went back and forth, and you, you and all the committee knows more about that than I do, between FEMA and the various trailer manufacturers. I, I just, I'm not aware of that. Okay. Well, we learned a year ago that FEMA uh, failed the families in the Gulf Coast. They refused to test the trailers because they didn't want to know the results and then have to take action to protect these families. And I think that's a shameful failure of government. Today we're learning that the largest maker of travel trailers did some testing and did know that its trailers had dangerously high levels, but it didn't warn anyone. And I think that's also a uh, shameful failure. Um, I'm going to, uh, I have uh, three, uh, three and a half minutes and I'm going to reserve that and now uh, recognize Mr. Davis. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to start with Mr. Souter. Yield him as such time as you may consume. I thank the uh, ranking member. Uh, I would prefer my question stick with the science and that we don't speculate. Politicians speculate, lawyers speculate, but we need to focus on the science and uh, that uh, there were some assumptions in the questions there uh, that were not science. Uh, Gulfstream did a desiccator test, which is not an accurate test, more of a snapshot, just like taking a formaldehyde tester in this room is a snapshot, not science, and then attempted to raise that question with FEMA. And uh, they went beyond the call of duty to do that, but it is not an accurate scientific test, and it was presented to you as though they had scientific evidence rather than a snapshot, which still should have been followed up on, uh, but nevertheless is different than having a control group or an actual test with that. Now, I've had some correspondence, and uh, both verbal through my staff and in the two uh, hearings at Homeland Security as well as the previous year with Center for Disease Control. And I want to ask on the record why there was not a control group at the time to see how much was related to other things in the area as opposed to the trailer. The response we got from CDC was there was an, it was compared to the national rather than what was happening at Katrina at the time or the region. Is that scientific yes, to sir. not have a control group? Yes, sir. I mean, you wouldn't have a control group on that. I, I think um, what we were asked to do was to look at the uh, various types of temporary housing units that were being used and see what the formaldehyde level was. Um, the ambient air has been measured in many parts of the country by a number of different researchers and has been found to be consistently at two, three, and four parts per billion. Now, one other, one other thing about formaldehyde that I think it's important to remember, um, and that is that no scientists that have looked at formaldehyde consider ambient air a driver of indoor formaldehyde levels. Okay, let me ask you this question. Your office this morning said that you had no reason to question a Tulane study that studied the ambient formaldehyde air levels within site-built homes in Louisiana at average 370 parts per billion, more than four times that found in FEMA trailers. That would suggest, since your office is aware of that, that you know that there are differences in Louisiana than elsewhere because I don't believe that site-built homes are testing that high nationally and that furthermore you're aware that in the Hancock study by your office in Mississippi that there was no measurable difference between those people who were in the trailers and were in other. That might suggest that other phenomena were occurring other than just the trailers. Sir, you have two, uh, you have two studies right. that suggest that the non-trailers had higher levels or at least equivalent levels. Can I, yes. can I answer? Um, the, the second study, the Hancock study, did not look at exposure. Um, it was tremendously handicapped by um, the absolute destruction of so many medical records. We did not have a, a base, 
on which we could prepare rates. So we were able to do what we could in what is called an EPI-8 investigation, which is led by a trainee and, and is conducted in a three-week period of time. With that in mind, um, it did look at, as a, as a secondary objective, it did look at whether or not we would see a difference in the children's respiratory symptoms, those living, having reported living in trailers and those that did not live in trailers, and we did not see a difference. Do I attribute that at all to formaldehyde levels? I do not. Um, the first study that you talked about, the lemur study, um, I have reviewed that study and it appears to be a well done study. Um, it, it used the NIOSH sampling method that we use, which is the gold standard sampling method. It was slightly different than the one we used, but it, it was the NIOSH method. Um, its results were well reported, I thought. It was a, a well written article. And its conclusions were, again, have nothing to do with ambient air outside in Louisiana. The conclusions were, um, and I am doing this from memory, but the conclusions were along the lines of we need to increase the ventilation in these homes, we need to look at what uh, furniture products and wood products are being used in these homes. Its conclusions were strikingly similar to the conclusions that came out of our occupied study. So when I was asked to review the, the, the Lemur study, I found that it was a, a well done study and well written and its conclusions were justified. Now, if you were to ask me why did that study find elevated levels of formaldehyde in those homes when many studies at the same time around the country did not, I do not have, a, I do not have an answer for that. And, and as you suggested in your opening statement um, and as I responded to Chairman Waxman, I am going to stick to the science. I, I did not know what the correspondence was between the manufacturers and FEMA, so I didn't comment on that. And so I don't know the answer, Congressman, as to why those levels were higher. And, but and I will tell you that the science will tell you that it is you, ambient air is not a driver of formaldehyde in indoor the, environments. The, well, let me ask you a couple other questions, because in your testimony you suggested that, that some of the things here are concentration. In other words, there has been this mis notion that somehow like these manufacturers spray formaldehyde on things. It is the products they put in. It is not unique to a trailer. It is unique to size and the, the wood and the wood quality, which we are debating. Now, uh, in a, in a site-built house or a manufactured home, uh, you said that they, which we have learned are apparently, at least from this one study, different in this particular environment and you don't know why. It could be heat, it could be number of people in, could be other patterns that occur in the house such as cooking, number of the intensity. Would, it, would you not think, based on your own statement, that, for example, when you put a new kitchen in, because much of this is a cupboard, depending on whether it has veneer or vinyl, can quadruple the parts coming off of a particular piece, when you put a new kitchen in a house that for a brief period until it dissipates, that kitchen area may have higher levels of formaldehyde. When you put new carpet in a room, particularly if it is a smaller bedroom, you are going to go up and down, that this is not an uncommon thing even everywhere, including in our own offices, including elsewhere. It is not unique to trailers other than that they are small. And any alternative housing that we would use, such as a tent, a small wood shelter, is long, uh, unless it uses pure natural wood with no adhesive, with no repellent, the smaller the area and the newer it is, the greater problem you are going to have. Abs absolutely. Uh, the, the component parts are what lead to formaldehyde. I, in my old house, I brought this desk in and I put it together. Um, and it was this beautiful desk that, I, that was perfect for the room. And I remember smelling the formaldehyde as I was unpacking it, which means at that time I was dealing with formaldehyde at, a, at least above 500 parts per billion. So when, what you bring into a house can definitely affect the formaldehyde levels. I, I, absolutely true. Well, I also wanted to establish the record. You said NIOSH is the gold standard. Um, there, is it true that their plus or minus is 19 percent? I, I don't know what their numbers are. But NIOSH is the gold standard. And if you look at the literature on the measurement of formaldehyde um, for all of the studies, they almost invariably use the NIOSH standard. I would like to insert into the record the uh, formaldehyde on the NIOSH standards. And the reason is, is because when we start to get down to really fine lines here, those variations become very significant. Um, and uh, we will reserve the balance of the time. Gentleman has. Uh, 
yield back to the right. No, uh, uh, how much time we have? This one, uh, one forty-seven. Uh, did Look, you the, want to put something in the record, Mr. Sauter? The key asked uh, to put, without objection, that welcome, your uh, request will be granted. Mr. Mann, thank you, Dr. McGinn. Thanks for being here. What is the federal government standard for indoor ambient air levels of formaldehyde in trailers? In residences, there in is travel trailers. There is none. There is none. Are there formaldehyde standards for the manufacturing housing industry? There is for manufactured housing. There is for the component parts. And I think that there are component part standards, but not an indoor ambient air standard. Is that correct? That is true, Congressman. Uh, the indoor levels of 400 parts per billion are target levels based on wood emission standards, uh, as I understand it. And these have been in place for 24 years. That, are you talking about the HUD language? Yes, sir. Yeah, that is language and, and is not a standard. And the way you described it seems accurate to me. And that is really not a, uh, I mean, from, from the not. CDC, that is not an appropriate standard, is it? It is not a standard, right. It, it, is, it is, from what I understand from HUD, and it is lonely at this table, um, the, uh, the language, what, when they announced their uh, component part numbers, the language said 400 parts per billion. Um, I have had many discussions with HUD and they do not consider 400 parts per billion now, a standard. In your discussions, have, have you worked toward promulgating any standards, any levels, any regulations that would define these so when the government contracts out, uh, contractors know what the rules are, people who are utilizing the trailers know what the rules are? Has CDC been proactive in that at all? CDC is trying to get government agencies together to address the formaldehyde issue. My boss, Dr. Howard Frumkin, is leading a group to try to do that. I, th I think you know, Congressman, and I think you would agree with this, that CDC is not a standard-setting agency. Correct. I think it is in the best interest of the American public and the Congress that CDC never become a standard-setting agency because we can go in and look at something solely from a public health perspective. However, there right now are no standards by which a manufacturer or anyone can say this is the ambient indoor air standard for formaldehyde in the United States. So as far as you know then, what was delivered here didn't, was not, uh, not meeting standards because there were no standards, unfortunately. There, there not only are no standards for travel trailers for uh, indoor ambient air for formaldehyde, but there are no standards, to my knowledge, and I have been immersed in this for the last 15 months, there are no standards for travel trailers for component parts because the HUD component part uh, um, standards only apply to um, manufactured homes and not to travel trailers. They are exempted from that. Thank you. That is my understanding. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. One of the things, just following up on what was just stated, clearly the United States of America should not be purchasing trailers that are going to bring harm to the American people. Would you agree that, with that? Of course, sir. Regardless of standard. And when we are talking about things like uh, watery eyes, burning sensations in the eye, nose and throat, nausea, coughing, chest tightness, wheezing, skin rashes and allergic reactions. The maldehyde exposure may also trigger attacks of those with asthma. Extremely high levels of exposure from maldehyde can immediately be dangerous to the health, to one's health and life. No matter what the standard is, the American people were purchasing trailers that could bring harm to other American people. That's, that's the face of this. In Katrina, we had people who were victimized at least twice. Their country failed them, except for the Coast Guard. And then they were living in these trailers that was failing them also. And I don't know what John Lewis said. I'm not going to, I'm not here to attack you, but I want to make, I want to make sure we keep the focus on this. I've said too many times over and over again, our country is becoming mired in a culture of mediocrity and failure to be empathetic to human beings. So we can talk about standards here, there and everywhere, but the question still remains, do we get what we bargained for? Are we getting something that does harm? Now, I understand that you didn't, you're not, not familiar with all the letters and the correspondence that went back and forth. But Dr. McGeehan, uh, Gulfstream sent a letter to FEMA that read in part, and I just need your opinion on this very quickly. And this is what the letter said. It said, and it's dated May 11th, 2006. It said, we wanted to follow up on our recent conversations regarding travel trailers supplied 
to FEMA. As we have previously indicated, we wanted to again let you know that we remain committed to providing high quality products. No particular information on ventilation or standards for indoor air quality, including formaldehyde, are required by government regulation relating to travel trailers. However, if, 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 if even though not required, Gulfstream has taken the added step of specifying low emission standards. And let me say, listen to what they said. We would like to reiterate our willingness to assist you in addressing any concerns about our products. Our informal testing has indicated that formaldehyde levels of indoor ambient air of occupied trailers fall below, for, in, for instance, the OSHA standard of 0.75 parts per million. Now, that, what that means is 750 parts per billion. We are willing to share these informal test results with you. And as mentioned during our meeting, if FEMA wishes to conduct formal testing protocols on any designated units, we are willing to participate in that testing. Now, you, did, you, did you hear that? Yes, sir. All right. What impression did you get from the letter? Does it sound like Gulfstream is aware that its trailers have high formaldehyde levels? I mean, from what you just heard? No, sir. And let me tell you that Gulfstream did not disclose that in, May, in that May 11, 2006 letter, what, this is what they didn't disclose. Gulfstream did not disclose that of the 11 occupied trailers it tested, every one of them showed my, my, my formaldehyde levels at or above 100 parts per billion. It did not disclose that four of the 11 occupied trailers had formaldehyde levels over 500 parts per billion. What, and, 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 and which is OSHA's uh, regulatory uh, action level. OSHA requires medical monitoring of employees exposed to levels over 500 parts per billion. Should Gulfstream have disclosed that information to FEMA? I, sir, I, that's, that's very hard for me to talk about a correspondence that I had nothing to do with and don't know anything about. If you were in their position, would you have disclosed it as, I, a, as, as somebody who I, is, I mean, as, as I, a, a, a expecting certain things from right. folk who are selling things to the American people with their hard paid tax dollars, would you have expected it? I, I would say, I would go back, sir, to what I said to the chairman, that I think that sort of information should be shared and that's a good thing to share that. And Gulfstream also did not disclose that its testing of unoccupied trailers showed even higher levels of formaldehyde. A large number of these uh, showed levels well over 750 parts per billion in unoccupied trailers. Should Gulfstream have disclosed that information, do you think? I think if they had that information on formaldehyde that was above 750 parts per billion, that that, that would have been a good thing to let FEMA know. Clearly, Gulfstream uh, spent over a month putting together this letter. They carefully crafted it. And this is what we came up with. And thank you very much. Again, this is about people. This is about human beings. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Cummings. Now to the Republican side, uh, Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, doctor, you are going to be the only scientist we have here. The next panel, uh, as the ranking member said, basically are people being sued as a result of the hysteria uh, that may or may not be valid around uh, uh, formaldehyde. Let me ask the first question is, uh, is there a universal standard or is there a number that you would set here today to say we should make sure trailers never have in them uh, under ordinary conditions? Sir, I, I would think that if we are going to talk no, no, about... No, 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 no. Is there a number? I am sure there is. It is not one that I am... Okay. You are not prepared to give it. That is true. Okay. Uh, yeah. The, uh, the second one, and I, I want to keep it short because I only have the five minutes. So today, the government, after this, you are not prepared to give a number. So 700, 500, 100. But let us take HUD's number for a moment. HUD said that uh, basically you can outgas at 300 parts per billion out of plywood. Is that number too high? For travel trailers? No. It is it's a standard for wood. It, it is a standard for wood. What we have shown in no, our No, but is the standard for outgoes gassing of wood, because once you make the wood, it is going to, you know, the, people aren't going to make a lot of different plywoods. There is only so much MDF and plywood going to be made. Once you have a, an, a standard for home travel trailers, and they are going to tend to use the same in these industries, is the standard of the, you know, basically the glue used to bond together either MDF 
or, or plywood, uh, is that an unreasonable standard or are you prepared to answer is that a good number? Sir, I will tell you what our study showed. I am not going to say whether that is an unreasonable number. I will show you that 44 of the 45 component parts met the HUD standard and yet for those four travel trailers the levels were in the multiple hundreds of parts per billion. Okay. So we have a standards problem today based on that in my opinion. Let me ask another, another question. You take plywood, carpet, plastic, you name it, the components that all can produce uh, formaldehyde, you put them in a, in a closed airtight oven, you heat them up to 160 degrees, are you going to get a, a concentration of formaldehyde inside the air chamber? You are going to get a lot of different contaminants probably. Okay. Yeah. But in fact, that is what a closed up trailer is in the hot sun. No matter who made it, no matter what they use, that is what you have. One, the elevated levels are to be expected in a closed up hot trailer. Two, uh, which means we shouldn't be testing them that way, that, that there has to be a standardized test. Can the CDC come up with a standardized test or should some agency come up with a standardized test so that we can be comparing apples and apples for levels of ventilation, et cetera, because it sounds like the government hasn't provided that yet either. Well, I think if an agency moves towards setting a standard, they will have to give guidance on how that standard would be measured. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the trailer manufacturers are going to be here after you and, and, you know, Gulfstream is the gold standard by most people's. I know you have a gold standard of testing equipment, but, you know, they are the gold standard for trailers, commercial off-the-shelf trailers, been around forever, well regarded. Mm -hmm. Most people know that name more than the other three manufacturers. Uh, did you find anything in your testing of those or other trailers that showed that these trailers were materially different than what the commercial public buys and, and happily works with on a regular basis? We weren't able to look at whether or not these were different from that. I mean, there, there, were, there are the off-the-lot models that were sold to FEMA and used, and there are the spec models that were sold to FEMA and used. Okay. Now, in your opening statement, you, uh, you said something that I think was very significant that I hope we can all focus on here today. You talked about mold creating formaldehyde, the relationship between the two. Uh, and I'll set up the question fairly narrowly. Louisiana, Mississippi, uh, there's a huge flood, stagnant water sitting there, unfortunately in some cases with sewage and all kinds of other things. Uh, it's wet, it's rainy, it's hot, it's humid. Uh, everything gets wet, including the people going in and out to try to salvage things. Mold is pervasive. In fact, is that a major contributor in all likelihood to the general unhealthy atmosphere that existed in that area of the South after Katrina? I think that mold in an indoor environment is not a good thing. I think that what we found in our, in our multiple regression was that mold was associated with formaldehyde levels, not causative of formaldehyde levels. There is a difference. So you are saying that formaldehyde, that plywood causes mold? No, sir. I am saying that the indoor air contamination may be related to both of them at the same time. I see. Uh, now, in your test, you tested for formaldehyde. Because you had a large amount of people in a terrible situation post-Katrina, did you test for anything else? I can't find any other testing for the effects of mold, mildew, uh, all the other chemicals, including sewage that backed up. What test can you provide us with that shows the other things that may have caused the same symptoms, uh, more or less, that are being reported and blamed on only one chemical, formaldehyde? Sir, we went to the field as rapidly as we could to answer the question that was pervasive at the time, which was formaldehyde. Um, and the study was aimed at formaldehyde. We, we controlled for smoking and some other factors with a questionnaire, but we tested for formaldehyde. Now, if you wanted to look at other VOCs that may be in the air of these trailers, we did, um, we te looked for 80 different VOCs in the Lawrence Berkeley study, found 33 that were measurable found three that might be considered elevated, and the focus ended up being on formaldehyde. Thank you, Mr. Thank Ice. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And um, I want to talk specifically about unoccupied trailers. Uh, between March and May of 2006, Scott Pullen, one of Gulfstream's vice presidents, tested occupied and occupied FEMA trailers for formaldehyde. All total, he tested about 50 trailers. He tested Gulfstream trailers and he also tested trailers made by other manufacturers. 
Mr. Pullen tested over 35 new travel trailers that had not yet been deployed for displaced residents. Of those trailers, over 25 were manufactured by Gulfstream and seven by other companies. The levels of formaldehyde in these unoccupied trailers were remarkable. Over 10 Gulfstream trailers contained formaldehyde levels in excess of 900 parts per billion. Uh, Dr. McGinn, is there any question that exposure to formaldehyde at that level is dangerous? Sir, most studies show that when you get up above 800 parts per billion or so, that most people will have symptoms at that level of formaldehyde. And so certainly at 900, it would be dangerous. Well, I, I don't, I mean, I, the word dangerous has connotations to it that I'm not really comfortable with. One of the things that we have tried to do in all our reports is to stay away from words that, that cause alarm. I would say that at that level we could expect a good proportion of the population to have symptoms that, that were described earlier. Well, then let me just uh, go on. The Environmental Protection Agency has established 900 parts per billion as an acute exposure guideline level. This level is des designed to guide emergency responders in understanding the risks from a once-in-a-lifetime exposure such as might occur after a chemical spill. According to EPA, a one-time exposure to formaldehyde at levels exceeding 900 parts per billion could lead to irreversible harm. Let me ask you, would it be appropriate to allow families to move into an unoccupied trailer that had formaldehyde levels of 900 parts per billion? Uh, I would say, Congressman, a family should not reside in a, in a trailer that has 900 parts per billion formaldehyde. One Gulfstream trailer had formaldehyde levels of 2,000 690 parts per billion. Other makes of travel trailers contain similarly high levels of formaldehyde, with 17 trailers having formaldehyde levels over 900 parts per billion, and one trailer having levels of 4,480 parts per billion. Is it safe? to allow families to move into trailers with these levels? Those, those, those levels are starkly higher than what we measured in our occupied. I, I don't know how those samples were taken, but across the board, if you have levels like that, it would be uh, an environment where many people, if not all people, would have the types of symptoms that we've talked about. Well, Dr. McGinn, I've been informed that Gulfstream did not inform FEMA that it had tested unoccupied trailers, nor did it disclose the remarkably high levels of formaldehyde in these trailers. In March of 2006, thousands of trailers were yet to be deployed. Gulfstream knew that there was a major problem, but they remained silent. And as a result, those unoccupied trailers became occupied trailers. Families moved in and families lived in those trailers. And undoubtedly, many suffered the consequences. I believe that somebody should be held accountable, whether it's FEMA or whether it's Gulfstream or both. Somebody should be held accountable for not alerting those families that they were moving into hazardous situations. I thank you very much, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much, Mr. Davis. Uh, Mr. Jordan? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have questions for the, for the second panel, so I'd be happy to yield my time to Ranking Member Davis. Uh, thank you very much, and I would start by just uh, yielding my friend, Mr. Rice, for a quick uh, question. Doctor, uh, the 900 parts per billion that was talked about in a closed up trailer, with what you would consider in a normal healthy environment, home, mobile home, travel trailer, of air exchange, this closed up amount would drop off to something between the two parts per billion that should be ambient 
and whatever was in that trailer. Isn't that true? It would drop off okay. when you opened up the trailer to some right. extent. So if you open up a trailer and you have a positive exhaust, either through an air conditioner that ducts in outside air or, or an exhaust fan, which trailers always come with, uh, what would you expect 900 parts per billion and outside of two to equalize that when it was properly ventilated? I have no idea. Okay, but just in a nutshell, if you're exchanging the air, you know, once every several minutes or let's say tw a couple times an hour, wouldn't you expect it to drop off to essentially whatever the constant uh, emission is at the highest, that, that it would be whatever is being outgassed because your ambient of two is coming in, you'd end up down in the less than 100, wouldn't you? Eventually you're going to achieve an equilibrium with the gases that are coming off of the component parts. Thank you. Let me, um, everyone I think here is appalled at what happened uh, to some of these poor victims of Katrina, that they ended up in, in, uh, in traders with a high formaldehyde, uh, people became sick, and I don't think anybody up here is anything but appalled by this. What concerns me today is we only have a small piece of the puzzle. We very much appreciate you being here, uh, lending your expertise on this. It's, it's, a, it's a very important part of it. But it seemed to me uh, we had a crisis. You had to get a lot of product online very, very quickly. And the government went out to the private sector, and there are really no set standards. Uh, the private sector, as they will testify, I think, had to get to go to new sources to try to bring product online very quick, some of it from China and, and, and the East. There was no checking. There were no clear standards of what's going on at points when the issue was raised by some of the companies. Uh, uh, the uh, FEMA tended to look the other way. And it, what's so sad today is we're focusing just on the manufacturers and not on the government, who I think has a lot of culpability here, not the CDC, I might add, but other agencies who, through time, have not promulgated standards, who haven't done the appropriate inspections, who I think were so concerned about getting product that they didn't look through uh, 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 just, just appropriate regulation and inspection that should have occurred. What concerns me is are we changing this in the future, when the next Katrina hits and we need to bring a lot of product online, I dare say, a lot of these companies that have uh, provided this in the past are probably unlikely to respond. Uh, what is being done to put standards up so everybody knows what they need to meet? Do you, do you have any idea, Dr. McGinn? You said that CDC is having discussions at this point. Right. I don't know if that will lead to standards or not. But I, I would like to take this opportunity, if I might, just to talk about the members of this panel look at things in one way and maybe the public health agency looks at it in a slightly different way. And I look at it from this standpoint, being immersed in this since last May. I look at it that I think we need to find out what the exposures were and what the effects of these exposures were on the people that were residing in these trailers. That is can, can I just stop there? You never found any 900 parts per billion in any of your inspections, correct? The highest level that we found, sir, was uh, 590 parts per billion in the, uh, in the Occupy trailer study. That was high. Okay. Um, so that, that's the one thing. And the other thing that, that has kind of driven me over the last few months is to try to figure out a solution for this for the future. Um, we went out and we met with India. I'm probably going to go over and I'm going to mess up everybody's time. But we went out and we met with the RVIA and the other industry in Indiana and had a very good uh, eight-hour session to talk about what we're doing and what they're doing. Um, I, th I think that somehow we've got to solve this problem, and I think it's going to have to be a government industry sort of solution to this problem, so that we have some sort of temporary housing units for the next time, and I hope this doesn't happen for very long, the next time we have a Katrina size issue hit. Um, the idea that we, that we don't solve this and that we're faced with this in whatever period of time I think is abhorrent to all of us. So pretty much what I have been focused on is trying to assess what happened to the people and we're going to try and do that with the children's health study. And then secondly, how can we make sure that this doesn't happen anymore? No. And, and my, my solution to that, and I'm not an enforcement agency and I'm here, here by myself as a public health agency, my solution to that I think it has to be government industry working together to Absolutely. figure this out. I just, I just no, think I, that's I the agree. Solution. And let me just say, Mr. Chairman, what concerns me is, is because of the slant of this hearing without having the government here, and we've seen this time and time again, I've had companies, experts, global companies, where the government will go to them and say, we need your help in Iraq, and they say, why are we going to do business with the government? 
I mean, and, and risk the exposure of coming before a committee, the lawsuits and everything else. It's a high risk for some of these companies that we forget that. Yeah. And if we had appropriate standards and oversight, this wouldn't happen. I hope it doesn't happen again. I think it's been very constructive. Thank it's you. It's not comfortable for any of us, sir. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Murphy. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I take some comfort uh, today in what seems to be a growing bipartisan consensus around this idea that we need to have standards, we need to have some level of enforceability, and that both industry and government have to be part of that solution, because this seems to be, uh, as Mr. Davis said, a very clear example in which the absence of that regulatory structure has led to some uh, very damaging situations for families and a very uncomfortable situation uh, for uh, government and its affiliated agencies. And in a uh, town in which there is a lot of derision thrown onto government regulation, um, this seems to be a perfect example of an area uh, in which there is a very appropriate role for the government to step in to make sure that we have the safety of uh, residents, especially in a crisis area such as the Gulf, um, at the forefront of our discussions for all of the aspersions that get cast um, on the regulatory structures the government may impose. We have examples like this which suggest that there are still places in which we need to step up to the plate. Um, Mr. McGeehan, I just wanted to get back to the science for, for a moment. We have heard a lot of efforts um, on behalf of members of this committee and of some of the companies that produce these trailers to explain away the levels of formaldehyde and understanding, as you have said, that there are lots of different explanations for why a um, a real world trailer or home might have elevated levels of formaldehyde. What we do have is your study. Um, and so I want to just get at some of these alternative explanations and uh, to the extent that they were factored into the work that you have done. Um, the chairman of the Gulf Stream um, asserts in his written testimony that we have before us today um, that um, cooking fish, for instance, is a substantial source of formaldehyde in indoor air. Um, and I want to go through a couple of these potentially alternative explanations. In the research that you have done on the trailers, have you come across any indication that the formaldehyde levels in these trailers were caused by abnormally high levels of cooked fish or other cooked products that would have been uh, uh, found in these trailers? No, for a number of reasons. We did ask the uh, residents who participated in the study whether or not they had used, uh, they had cooked in their trailer for a period of time prior to that, not only because the products that were cooking could give off formaldehyde, but also the type of gas they use for cooking may. So we controlled for that and did not find that to be a factor in our analysis. Uh, the President of Keystone RV states in his testimony that formaldehyde is quote, found in household cl uh, cleaners, antiseptics, cosmetics, and medicines. Again, any indication in the trailers that you have tested that the, um, uh, that the high levels of formaldehyde are caused by uh, cosmetics or cl household cleaners? No, we did ask about uh, use of a number of different household cleaners and did not find that to be a factor. And finally, there is a suggestion here that, uh, again, I wanted to let you restate this, that mold and potentially backed up sewage can also lead to some levels of toxicity or high levels of formaldehyde. Any um, indication that in the trailers you tested that mold or sewage uh, led to the high levels of formaldehyde? We, we measured mold in two different ways through the walkthrough with the trained personnel and also we asked the uh, residents about mold and mold was a factor in the, uh, in the um, multivariate analysis that we did. Um, I don't believe mold was the source of the formaldehyde. I think the quality of the air that leads to high formaldehyde levels also leads to mold. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Doctor. I, I understand the nuanced conversation here about the different factors that can contribute to high levels of formaldehyde. Um, but we are dealing with science here. We are dealing with uh, studies that have been done by a trusted agency um, that have controlled for these very factors. And it is a legitimate conversation to have except for the fact that we have a study in front of us which shows us that we have unacceptable levels of formaldehyde even controlling uh, for many of these factors that have been brought before us. I yield back the balance of my time. Uh, if the gentleman would permit uh, uh, to me, uh, I, yield I, to the chairman. I do want to point out, because we have had several complaints that we haven't had government witnesses here. We invited other government witnesses. We invited FEMA. Uh, we have invited all the uh, government agencies that have been requested uh, by Mr. Davis and other members of the committee. Uh, they did not agree to come here. But we did have a hearing on this subject with FEMA. Mr. Chairman. 
Yes. Well, you, my understanding is from FEMA and uh, is it that they didn't get the invitation until Thursday before the weekend to come here for this hearing, and that's why they declined. Now, I still wish they could have been here. I think it would have added a lot, but I think it would have helped to have uh, been able to get them all here well, at the same time, so they could point fingers at each other. I don't disagree with you, except I do want to point out they. You may. I think you're misinformed. They were invited at the same time that the CDC was asked to come here. And we have CDC represented here, and FEMA re refused to come. But we did hear from FEMA last time around, and what we heard from FEMA is they didn't want to know about the problem. They, didn't, they, didn't, they just didn't want anybody to do any evaluations because they were afraid they'd find high levels. If I can yield myself another 30 seconds of, uh, of my own time that I reserved before. Um, we, we've heard the statement we ought to have government and industry working together to protect the consumers. I think we have a good example here of government and industry working together to hurt the consumers. Government didn't want to know the information. FEMA didn't want to know what levels of, of formaldehyde were in these trailers. And then we have Gulfstream trailer manufacturers who don't feel any, any moral or, 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 or other responsibility to let FEMA and the families know that they've done tests in these trailers and they find high levels of formaldehyde, which they obviously knew uh, were thought of as, uh, as excessive and, and harmful to people's health. So what we have is the government failure and industry failure. If we pass laws with standards, I, I, I think that's great. But what we got to make sure is that uh, the representations that are made to the government are uh, about what's actually happening and the government asks the questions and they work together uh, to make sure the public's protected. I think what, we can, what we've seen here is no regulation and no self-regulation by the industry as well. Uh, I now want to yield to Mr. Burton five minutes. Will the gentleman yield me just 20 seconds? Uh, yes. L let me just note again for the record, I'd ask of unanimous consent, this is a, well, this is a chart from our uh, minority report. 98.8 percent of the temporary housing units tested by the CDC in Louisiana and Mississippi met the HUD ambient air targets for formaldehyde. One of the problems here is that that target level is probably too high and it ought to be changed. But the customer in 90, practically 99 percent of the cases met it and there weren't inspections in some of the uh, uh, other instances. So, you know, as we take a look at this, I think that we need to uh, focus on what the government did as the buyer. There was no direct selling between uh, the, the trailer manufacturers and the end users. They sold to the government and the government had bad standards in some cases. And in other cases, when the manufacturers went to the government and said there was a problem, the government said, let's not talk about it. Thank you. Well, if, I, if the uh, gentleman might permit that, HUD standard uh, is Mr. not an Chairman, adequate standard. It's not even Ms. a standard. I just made that point, Mr. Chairman. It's not an adequate standard. Hey but guys, why beat on up on time. the customer? Mr. Chairman, you're on my Mr. time. Burton, your time. Thank you. I'm not going to take uh, very much time. I, I would like to have my whole statement presented for the record, but uh, I've been familiar with the travel trailer and, and trailer industry uh, since I was a kid, and I haven't seen any evidence that this is a, that they've violated any rules and haven't done their job uh, to perfection. There's over 8 million people in this country that live in mobile homes and RVs and travel around the country with no problems with the formaldehyde uh, issue we're talking about today. And so instead of beating on the uh, manufacturers, I think we ought to uh, give them a, a little vote of confidence because they have such a good track record in the past. And with that, I yield to my colleague, Mr. Souter from Indiana. I thank my uh, friend from Indiana. And while there may be uh, differences of opinion, um, I, I really am deeply concerned about the use of the word moral to apply to people who worked overtime to provide units. Uh, to uh, people who were in housing crisis. Uh, they uh, may have worked their people hard. Uh, they uh, did it at, under great pressure. We had tremendous hiring challenges in, in Indiana, training challenges, but they worked overtime to try to meet the standards at half the cost of a normal unit. And that um, I, I believe the gentleman, the chairman, was more referring to a question. And I think that as we try to make sure that people live in safe homes and that people work in safe plants. This debate is not about emotion or rhetoric. It is, in fact, about science. And that one of the core fundamentals that's being tossed around here is whether a golf streams test constitutes science. It was a flash test 
with a desiccator method, which is not the way that you test. Now, should FEMA have responded to then do scientific tests, we can't pretend and keep asking uh, Dr. McGeehan what, how he would have reacted to something that was a flash warning test, like you do with a formaldehyde test or that type of thing. We're making <coughs> big judgments here on the morals of people based on the fact that one company did have concerns with a shipment of wood, then did a flash test on that, did say a range, but didn't give all of it because the variation is far too great to be scientific with the method that they used. Now, uh, I also want to make sure that when Mr. S uh, uh, when Mr. Murphy asked some questions, that it isn't really scientific to say when he asked, did you test to say the individuals were asked because in fact you didn't test to see whether other things caused the, the standards. You asked them whether they did anything. Right. We did it with, I, I think I stated that we did it with a questionnaire and that we controlled for it in the analysis. I, th I think I exactly said those words. That but I, but I, it shouldn't I, be taken here that there was any test done on other, other things. That was a, uh, a self-dependent reference referral rather than uh, a actual scientific test to see what else was there. And we come back to this Tulane study that said the ambient air standard in Baton Rouge was 390 parts per billion. That was the average, which means they had four times what you were finding in these trailers average. Would you recommend that 390 average, which means probably some of them are in the five, 600 range, that everybody who lives in that region should move out? I would recommend exactly what the uh, authors of that recommended. Which is? That people should look, they should look to ventilate their houses more, that they should look at what component parts they're putting in and, and what additional work they're having done and on that their houses. Is then your recommendation for the trailers as well, not panic? I'm sorry, sir, I didn't hear the In other words, of that. if yeah, they're averaging 390 in, Louisi in Louisiana in a general site built house, um, which is higher than the average here, would you make the same recommendations for emergency FEMA trailers that you just made to Baton Rouge? Why are we having a double standard of did, feeding we, on this group and not basically the same level of concern about possibly the entire southern region there? Well, Congressman, we did make that recommendation. We recommended that FEMA move the people out of these units before the weather became hot and the levels went back up. In the meantime, we did recommend that people ventilate their trailers more, be careful what, do not smoke inside their trailers. You're taking back my time, did you recommend the same thing to the people in Baton Rouge? Sir, we didn't there do 390 that. 390? We didn't do that yeah. study, sir. Okay. That but was you a study. already testified you felt it was an accurate study. The question is, is why would you make a recommendation to one group and not the other? Sir, that was a study that was done nine years ago. That, that was given to me two days ago. Um, I, I can't go back and recommend to the f citizens that are in those homes that they move out. I mean, that, that, that's not what we would do. This is a study that I was asked, did I think that this was a, what did I think about this study? And I gave you that assessment. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, now, Mr. Sarbanes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. When you decide, when, when you do a test and you may have covered this, I apologize if you have, but when you do a test to determine if, if, the, if the standards being satisfied or whether a trailer is safe or not safe, um, do you do it with the windows closed? Do you do it with the windows open? Do you do it with a fan running? I mean, what's the, what's sort of the... For our occupied study, what we wanted was to, for people to set their trailers up the way they normally have their trailers when they're sleeping. So okay. we asked them to set it up. If they keep their windows open three inches, if they keep their windows wide open, if they keep the air conditioning running, however they set their trailers up for that period of time, that's how we asked them to set their trailers up and that's how we sampled. We wanted it to be the most realistic exposure that we could. But that would mean you'd end up with a different, you sort of end up on a, on a trailer by trailer basis coming up with what the... We were interested in what the human beings were being exposed to for formaldehyde. Okay. The second question I have is in terms of the sustained exposure, so day after day after day. Is somebody who's exposed to, let's say, 250 parts per billion um, for 50 days in a row, 
at a higher risk of some kind of harm than somebody who's exposed to 250 parts per billion for 10 days in a row and then are not exposed to that subsequent? It's essentially what you're doing when you look at human exposure to any contaminant is in one way or another you're, you're basing it on an index. And the, the index is based on the intensity of the exposure, in this case the level of formaldehyde that you're mentioning, and the duration of exposure, how long they're exposed. And when you're dealing with contaminants, I think the rule of thumb is to try to decrease either of those components as much as you can. Either decrease the intensity by decreasing the amount of exposure that they have to formaldehyde and or decrease the duration of exposure. You don't want people being exposed to a contaminant that causes symptoms. And the more you can decrease either one of those, you decrease the exposure index. So, so they, there's a cumulative dimension to there's a cumulative the potential dimension harm that can come. Particularly when you get into the carcinogenic potential of formaldehyde. Formaldehyde by the Inter Inter International Agency for Research on Cancer, IARC, is considered a human carcinogen. And when you, when you have human carcinogens, you really want to try to decrease a person's exposure as much as possible. Right. So it becomes relevant, the use for which a trailer is being put. Uh, well, we, we absolutely believe that. One yes. of the recommendations when we were talking to FEMA is, is that why, while you don't want to get into a specific number when people are living in a unit, one of the issues is how is that unit being used? If you have a family with young children and they're in the unit 24 hours a day, as, as some of the families in the parks were, that's different than a person who has a unit parked outside their home who spends eight hours at work and then comes home and spends four and a half hours repairing the roof to try to move back into their home. So the, the use of the trailer is an important part of the level of exposure. You know, people keep referring to the emergency circumstances as a excuse slash explanation for folks being put in harm's way where there was these high formaldehyde levels. Um, but leaving that aside for a minute, would you agree that if the alarm had been sounded earlier um, and more consistently by both the manufacturers and FEMA that we would have gotten started much earlier on doing the kind of thinking you say you've been doing about how we can fix this problem going forward and think about the kinds of housing that should be available to people in these disaster recovery situations. I, I think it's, it's fairly easy to, to, to imagine the timeline that we currently have being moved up yeah. and then moving everything up whatever mo a number of months that may have been. I mean FEMA, I'm running out of time, but FEMA's um, only just recently come up with a national disaster housing plan. Um, well actually it's just a preliminary blueprint I guess and Congress called for it two years ago and that would have included and should have recommendations on creating different kinds of inventory of housing opportunities in these disaster situations. We could have gotten started much earlier on that if people had been come clean earlier uh, with the information on these, these kinds of exposures. I yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Sarbanes. Uh, Mr. Shays. Thank you. Uh, I'll first yield to um, my uh, ranking member and then I'll take the rest of the time. Mr. Chairman, we had talked about notification. I, I have letters from you to Steve Preston, the Secretary of HUD, uh, Steve Johnson, the Administrator of EPA, John Howard, the National Institute for, uh, I mean, from OSHA, uh, uh, Ed Falk from, uh, uh, all, all from OSHA, and uh, the Nancy Nord from the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission, Jan July 3rd, that's last th uh, Thursday, inviting them to come to testify before the committee. And I understand there was a letter uh, slightly earlier than that to FEMA, but they told us they didn't get it until um, Thursday, the uh, manufacturers have been on the hook here for a month have known that they were coming here. So this isn't uh, trying to get everybody together uh, at one table to discuss this. 
This was almost an afterthought, and as a result of that, we have an incomplete hearing. This was a tragedy, what happened here to, to some of the families that had these high levels. It shouldn't happen. It shouldn't have happened. It should never happen again. And we ought to focus on what we can do. But the government bears a prime responsibility here for not appropriate inspections, not reacting to what some of the manufacturers had told them early on that there were problems, not going through improper inspections, even with a, uh, a moving uh, uh, and very uncertain uh, standard. And so that is the difficulty here. And when you have lawsuits outstanding against some of these companies, we know how this works. We're all adults. You're going to have lawyers put in testimony from some of the members of Congress and some of the staff reports into the record before juries to try to get high awards. And so they're trying this. And we've seen this happen before, unfortunately. We understand the politics of that. But that is so unfortunate here about not having the government here and working toward a solution instead of trying to frame a lawsuit. And that's my major concern with this. What happened was a tragedy. It shouldn't happen again. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chase. Happy to yield. Uh, let me uh, uh, first, uh, Doctor, thank you for coming. Thank you for your good work. This is a very important issue, and we appreciate your expertise and talents. Uh, I would like to ask about what happens in the future FEMA has specified a new procurement specification of 16 parts per billion regarding formaldehyde in FEMA trailers. Uh, first, do you think this new procurement specification uh, number of 16 parts per billion is reasonable? Um, we, weren't, we weren't asked, Congressman, to comment on that before FEMA came out with that. Um, I think I know on which that is based, which is based on a NIOSH standard that was uh, um, based on formaldehyde being considered a carcinogen, and and at that point, 16 parts per billion, I believe, was the lowest level that could be detected by the uh, analysis of uh, air sampling at that time. Um, I, I think 16 parts per billion across the board for temporary housing um, is is going to be a difficult mark to make. Thank you. Let me ask you, in your interim report, figure two depicts 100 parts per billion of formaldehyde as an intermediate range and 1,000 parts per billion as a higher range. So does CDC still stand by the figure? In light of the mean result from the CDC trailer study being 77 parts per billion, wouldn't it be inappropriate and misleading to classify trailer formaldehyde levels as high? What we tried to do with that was have a sliding scale so that people understood that it wasn't just a one-time measurement of formaldehyde that determined whether or not an environment was safe and healthy or not, that, it, that there were other factors involved. What, what CDC has done from the beginning of this is to look at the literature and to go by what the literature says that levels of formaldehyde in an indoor environment may cause symptoms. And at those levels, that is how we basically have approached this problem. Right. Now, but, bear, but, okay, but I'm it, sorry. But in your interim report, it's basically 100 to 1,000, but 100 being kind of the low range, uh, which is still higher than the 77 parts per billion. So do you need to adjust that number down of 100? No, I think that was done by the graphics people because it, it made some sense to have a hundred and a thousand. If, uh, if you're looking at the colored version of that, you'll see a, 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 a gradation in that, um, in the hundred, between a hundred and, and one thousand, where various symptoms occur. And um, I, don't, I don't think we need to adjust that particular graphic because we've been consistent in what we've said from the very beginning that at 100 parts per billion, sensitive individuals show symptoms. Uh, there's a number of studies that show 300 parts per billion. Um, and uh, at 100 parts per billion, there are a number of agencies, WHO, EPA, ASHRAE, that right. talk about that is the level that uh, action should be taken. So I'm very, I'm very comfortable at the 100. If you're concerned about the 1,000. Um, no, I'm not concerned. I'm just, I'm just making the point, and I think you've answered it, that 100 to 1,000 is a uh, an illustration, but a thousand is pretty low, uh, and um, there are some symptoms that show at that point. But 100. it does suggest that it's certainly higher than 16 or 77. Right, 77 was the geometric mean that we found across the board. I think what you what you need to do when you look at that study is it's it's. I'm sorry, I'm, I think I'm. No, no go ahead. And is your that yeah? You, you also have to look that for some manufacturers, 56 percent of theirs were above 100. Okay. 
gentleman's Thank you. time has expired. Uh, Ms. Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I want to thank Dr. McGeehan. And uh, I'd like to ask you about a CDC study where you worked on the uh, Lawrence, or uh, you worked with uh, the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. As I understand it, uh, you actually deconstructed uh, four travel trailers that were purchased by FEMA. And uh, these trailers were taken apart so you could test the emission level of volatile organic chemicals from the component parts of the trailers. And these tests showed that formaldehyde was being emitted inside the travel trailers from the component parts. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. They also showed that formaldehyde was the only volatile chemical uh, in the travel trailers that was at a level high enough to negatively impact uh, human health. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Uh -huh. Were you aware that the Gulf Stream also conducted the test of its component parts two years ago? No, I was not. Okay. Based on documents that uh, were obtained by this committee, it appears that they did and the company actually hired another company called Progressive Engineering to test individual samples of the paneling. And Gulfstream itself appeared to have tested uh, the fiberboard, vinyl, and the drawers to determine their formaldehyde levels. That sounds similar to the tests that you conducted. Is that so? Yes, it does, depending on what type of chamber testing they did, but yes, it does. Yeah. Uh, let me tell you what this company found as a result of its testing, um, progressive engineering found elevated levels of formaldehyde emitting from the paneling. And if we were reading uh, Gulfstream's notes correctly, they found high levels from the other components as well. Uh, if you had been informed of this information two years ago, would it have raised concerns for you? Well, again, I'll go back to what I've reiterated. Yes, ma'am. Uh, any information that shows levels of formaldehyde at yeah. levels that can cause symptoms would have been of concern to yeah, us. Yeah, I, I know some of this is redundant, but no, I'm, that's fine. That's I'm fine. trying to no, I understand. move forward. And would, have, would it have been beneficial for FEMA or CDC to have uh, this information when it began investigating these issues? And I've heard you say earlier that if we've had that information, we could have moved on it, correct? I think any information early on would have been of great benefit. Okay. So the problem is that the company did not tell FEMA about these component tests. And Gulfstream had a contract with FEMA that was worth $550 million to manufacture these travel trailers. And when it learned in 2006 that there was a formaldehyde problem with the trailers it manufactured, the company chose to remain silent. And so FEMA has been rightly criticized for its response to Hurricane Katrina and its response to the formaldehyde problem, but it should not bear all the blame. So we need to be talking to each other openly honestly in a transparent way. That's the reason why we have these oversight uh, committee hearings. So a tragedy like this and our response will not have been as flawed as it was. So uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back my time, but I wanted to make that point. Can I, and can thank I, you, Doctor. Can I ask yes, a question? Doctor. If, if, those, if those data are available, we, we would love to see them because one of the things that we want to do in follow up to the work that we just did with Lawrence Berkeley is okay. to try to get some of the original um, component parts and see what they off gas and see if we can model to see what happened over okay, the two year uh, period. Mr. Chairman, through the chair, if we can ask staff to provide if you the could doctor do that, that with way. that information. Well, so we'll certainly try to make that okay. available to you. I think Great. it's a reasonable request and I, I would assume the manufacturers would agree with that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yield back. Uh, Mr. Sauter, you have not taken your five minutes. Do you want to uh, proceed now? Okay. Thank, thank the chair. Um, 
I, I think it's, it's really important because I know that uh, you get questions directed at you and some of these you, you weren't familiar with. The, the Gulfstream test was a desiccator test, not a chamber test. There was no chamber test done. That they did a, a uh, which your agency says has to be done multiple times. Uh, they hired a firm to try to do this test to do, because they suspected that the wood might have a problem. They tried to alert FEMA. They told them uh, a general range because it's not scientific. Mm -hmm. You use the word chamber. Do you agree that chamber testing is the way you do scientific testing? Right, that would be the gold standard for this. And, and would you agree that the other is probably not even a bronze? particularly if you just do it once and you flash test because number of people, what may ha be happening that day, you said yourself 100 to 1,000 because there may be temporary things occurring? Well, sir, I don't, I don't, know, what this, I don't know whether or not it has been compared to the standard, but if, if there were data that showed whatever testing they did was compared to the standard, then we could make that right. assessment. Right. In other words, we don't have that assessment. I, don't, I certainly don't. Yeah, well, they didn't either because they didn't do chamber testing. Right. Uh, all they were alerting FEMA to is, hey, there may be some problem. Now, the, the, the standard that, that Lawrence Berkeley Labs can, said this, as containing high levels of formaldehyde probably resulted from cheap wood used by the manufacturers under permissive government standards. Uh, do you think from your own testing that the, the variations, because most of them fell here, were resulting from probably uh, a certain type of wood, or are you willing to agree with how Lawrence Berkeley is probably the best we can come up with there? Well, I think the Lawrence Berkeley report is the best data that we have on the component parts used. So that, that uh, while there may be other variables, uh, that um, if to the degree we had a problem there, it ap appears to have been aggravated at least by the wood. Um, yeah. You use a very understated term. You said it would probably be pretty hard to achieve uh, 16 level. Right. That's probably true since the average rooms that have been tested here, not in chamber tests, are between 30 and 70, uh, which means that we better not put anybody in our house office buildings uh, in an emergency. Uh, so probably saying 16 is, is a pretty understated statement. I appreciate you uh, pointing that out. And I want to come back because the Hancock study and the Tulane study were not by you. Well, the, the, the Mississippi one was. And you explained the difficulties you, uh, with that. Because we've been going back and forth here today between di chamber tests, non-chamber tests, different agencies, uh, using uh, something from a, a flash test that's nowhere near a gold standard that was, was used in say, quoting some high figure. That, and we go back and forth between ambient air and testing of the wood. Uh, we go back and forth between people, ones that people are living in and ones that have been packaged up uh, with no ventilation, uh, some new, some old. We don't have the VIN numbers. The agencies don't appear to have those numbers to be able to match up. It appears that the numbers didn't even match up right in some of the cases with the manufacturers, uh, that there are, are significant <coughs> problems. Now, I want to come back because in Hancock, where it tested ambient air that with the limitations, there wasn't a difference between the trailers and the housing. And in the Tulane study, which is NIBOSH, and what you said was gold standard, that the average was 390, where the average on these trailers was 77 or 87. Now, why, to come back to this, it's not your agency, and you didn't do that study, you only reviewed it two days ago, but if we're panicked about what we keep hearing of 400, uh, 200 could be exposure, 100 could be, wouldn't that be suggesting that CDC and others ought to be checking everything in the state of Louisiana and elsewhere since they're four times the average standard of these trailers? The average is four times higher. Why isn't there panic about the whole region if we're panicking about 100 and 200? <clears throat> well, sir, there must, have, there must be something unique about the houses that were tested in that study. Um, ambient air is not a driver for formaldehyde in indoor let, air. Let me, let me ask the question. Um, do you have any scientific evidence that there was anything unusual about their test? No, I, I think the testing process that they used according to the article that I read was then fine. Then your answer was not scientific in saying it must be something else because in fact they were site-built homes that in fact we could have a problem with all site-built homes 
you don't know the answer to the question. Except that I am familiar with formaldehyde, sir, and formaldehyde, outdoor air is not a driver for indoor formaldehyde. Well, it doesn't, it just, they, their test didn't suggest it was outdoor but they're, air. If you, if you read their conclusion, sir, they are not suggesting that it's ambient air either. They are suggesting that it is some product inside the, the, either a ventilation issue or the products that are used inside the home. Which is the same question that we have here with Absolutely. these trailers. And Absolutely. my point isn't that uh, the ambient air, I, I'm sorry if I confused the ambient air because that was a question a little more potentially over in Hancock, that the question is that if they got this, these results that are four times higher, which could be the wood, which could be the ventilation, why aren't we concerned in looking at those houses like we're concerned about these houses because it might not just be the poor people here, it may be the poor people all over that zone. And it may be the poor people in other types of, of homes uh, because we're making in my opinion, picking on one industry without really having a belt. Thanks, the Chairman. Time has expired. Did you, was that a question? Did you have a response to that? Well, I, I just, I want everybody in the panel to know that, that CDC and I are not picking on an industry at all. I mean, we've had uh, good conversations with the RVIA and other industry. Um, we've had, they've attended our, uh, our scientific oversight panel meetings twice. Um, I think that our people have gone out to their factories to see how they operate. Um, there's, uh, from our standpoint, there's no industry bashing going on with CDC in any way, shape, or form. I, I simply state, as I stated before, that we're trying to get the answers for this. We're trying to provide good data. I quite frankly think that the LBNL study that we just completed and just published should be something that industry jumps on and looks at very carefully because I think it gives a lot of guidance as to what the problems might be and how they might be solved. Yeah. And I, I just want to make that statement. I think that's an excellent point. Gentlemen's time has expired. Mr. Tierney? No questions. Uh, would the gentleman yield me? Uh, I certainly will yield to the chairman. Some, some of his time. I, I want to point out uh, the, the uh, situation because we've heard complaints about some other witnesses from other agencies not being here. The manufacturers were invited because this is a hearing about the manufacturers on June 9th, 2008. On July 1, uh, the, our staffs, bipartisan staffs, uh, heard from CDC because CDC was doing a study about formaldehyde levels as a result of our first hearing with FEMA over a year ago. And as a result of our hearing where we questioned why FEMA didn't do anything about this problem, uh, uh, FEMA said, oh, we're going to ask CDC to do an evaluation. So CDC was ready to report its evaluation and to release it on July 2. So when our staffs talked to, uh, I don't know if it was you, Mr. It was Dr. Me. McKeon, it was. I guess it was, and heard what the report was, the Republican staff said, well, let's invite FEMA back as well as CDC. So we sent an official invitation to FEMA and the CDC on July 1, and this was an official invitation to come. Sometime uh, later in the week, the Minority then said, well, wait a second, we ought to have HUD as well to come in and talk about these standards and, and, and in order to get all the relevant witnesses regarding standards. Well, our staff replied, this isn't a hearing about standards. This is a hearing about whether the manufacturers had s information that they should have shared with the government, FEMA, and whether they should have shared it with the people living in the trailers. But nevertheless, we send an invitation to HUD, NIOSH, EPA, CPSC, and OSHA on July 3. Now, uh, that's awfully late, and they said they weren't available to come. Uh, FEMA said they couldn't come at all because they're busy with the uh, emergencies that are going on. So I want to make that uh, point very clearly and yield to Mr. Davis if he wants to uh, no. add anything further. No, thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, let me just note the CDC report was final, I think, July 2nd, but we had information on July 1. But that was the final report. The interim report was in February, as I understand right. it, and there wasn't a substantial change, was there, between no, the two. Sir. So this has been common knowledge. We have had plenty of time to plan for this. Secondly, I mean, the, the difficulty here is when a contractor responds to standards from the government and doesn't meet those standards, they ought to be held accountable because you have standards. We know this case we didn't have standards. You had conflicting standards throughout government over what meant uh, what, where, and ambient air standards between HUD and EPA and everybody else. Yeah, but if I could reclaim my time, that, that's, 
that's a, uh, an odd issue to raise. It's, it's confusing because we have so many different standards. But uh, when we have different standards, we can look and see, well, does that make sense to have the standards we have? Uh, but what we're concerned about is the health and well-being of people living in these trailers. And the Center for we Disease are. Control, which does not establish standards, is giving us their professional judgment about when it's a risk for people living in those trailers. And even if we took the report from the manufacturers of over 100 parts per billion, CDC, Dr. McGeehan has testified over and over again that he thinks that's awfully high amount of formaldehyde for people to be living with. Now, HUD has a different uh, standard. And it's a lower, uh, it's a different number. It's a, it's a, uh, 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 that people can live with uh, more formaldehyde than what uh, Dr. McKeon is pointing out. We've heard complaints that, well, the, the manufacturer study wasn't uh, adequate. It wasn't done professionally. It was only a flash study. I don't know. We'll go into that with the next panel. But what they knew from their evaluation, however complete it was, is that there was a problem going on that they were getting very high ratings of formaldehyde in these trailers. And knowing that, they misled, I believe actually misled FEMA when they said, we're not getting complaints when in fact they were. And we have done some studies, but uh, the, the impression was it's not a big problem, but we'll share our studies with you. So they had some sense that maybe FEMA wasn't going to ask, and they would share it, I presume, if they were asked. But FEMA didn't ask, which is uh, not a good point for FEMA, and the trailer manufacturer didn't share the information but seemed to say, we've got some studies that, uh, but we haven't had any complaints. But if, if that, what they knew is that uh, it was more than 100 parts per billion, and they knew it was in, in, way in excess of that, uh, they should have had some suspicions that maybe, in fact, I believe they had some suspicions that people were at risk. Mr. Chairman, I do believe, I mean, in the next panel, they're the companies, they can take care of themselves and we ought to ask those questions there. But there is also ample evidence that in many of these cases, they passed on this information to FEMA and FEMA either ignored it or didn't want to address the situation. As I noted before, um, almost 99 percent of the temporary units that were tested by the CDC in Louisiana and Mississippi met the HUD ambient air targets for formaldehyde standards. And these standards, I think, were bad standards. And we ought to focus on but changing I, I, these what standards. What kind of an argument is that to make that the manufacturers uh, knew they met a standard that wasn't a good standard, well, uh, and, they, and therefore it was okay for them not to share the information. I don't believe they shared the information with FEMA. They invited FEMA to ask them further information. FEMA never asked. Well, that, I don't we think can they settle that with the next on. panel. But if you're well, going to we'll start holding contractors to some moving standard, I, I don't think you'll ever get anybody to do business with the government again. And that, that's the Whether difficulty. Whether there's a standard or not, I think a manufacturer of a product has a responsibility not to harm the people we, using it. We all it. agree with that. There, there's no question about that. But the question here is if you're meeting a standard and it's the wrong standard, is that the government's fault for setting the wrong standard or is that the contractor's problem for meeting a standard? And I think we can have that argument. But you, you well, seem to have, want to put, put ex post facto standards no standard. into account. And, and I don't no think that's appropriate. We can all agree to that. There was no standard for them to meet. Well, there was a HUD standard and they met it 99 percent of the time and there weren't inspections. But we can have this discussion with the next panel. It's not my intent they to defend They had test anybody. results over 2,000 and 4,000 parts per billion. This mm -hmm. is over and above any of the standards, all of the standards, worse than any of the Mr. Chairman, the there standards was no themselves. finding of any delivered trailer that had anything close to that, as Dr. McGeehan has testified. The highest standards they had were, I think you had a couple over 500. No, I'm talking about what the manufacturers reported. I'm talking about tests. what they delivered to the government. That's what we're talking about, not what they found in reports. Well, Mr. Tierney's time has expired, and it's now Mr. <laughs> uh, Clay's opportunity to pursue <laughs> questions. I'm so glad I have some time left, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, last winter, um, CDC tested levels of formaldehyde in a group of randomly selected travel trailers and mobile homes. Uh, CDC finalized this report on these testing results just last week. Uh, Dr. CDC found that trailers manufactured by Forest River, Gulfstream, Keystone, and Pilgrim all had elevated levels of formaldehyde. Is that right? Yes, sir. Uh, the CDC study states that formaldehyde levels tend to be higher in newly constructed trailers 
and during warmer weather. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That's pretty well accepted. So in your expert opinion, would the elevated levels that CDC discovered in the winter of 07 have been even higher two years ago in 05? Yes, sir. And in your expert opinion, with the formaldehyde levels that CDC discovered in the winter of 07 uh, have been even higher during the summer? Temperature and humidity are direct drivers of formaldehyde levels, so I would say yes, sir. The uh, CDC study provides us with a snapshot of what families were exposed to last winter. Uh, but when we account for the passage of time and uh, temperature fluctuations, these families were likely exposed to even higher levels of formaldehyde than indicated in your report. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That's in our report. It's in your report? Yes, sir. Th that exact language is in our report. You know, what's so troubling about the uh, decision by Gulfstream not to inform the residents of its testing uh, more than two years ago uh, is the fact that no, no one was, was made aware who, who lived in, the, in these trailers and mobile homes. Uh, Gulfstream found that every trailer it tested had formaldehyde levels higher than 100 parts per billion. It found that some had as high as 500 parts per billion. And we all know that FEMA failed miserably in the wake of hurricanes Katrina and Rita. Uh, but these poor hurricane victims have now been subjected to a second disaster and years of unnecessary and harmful exposure uh, to a known carcinogen. Uh, do you think they should have been notified a little sooner? Or, or well, again, sir, I, I will say what I said from the beginning, that, that, that as much information that can be given to residents about effects that might be harmful to them is, is a good thing. I mean, we believe in disseminating that sort of information. I'm not commenting on any of the results that we're talking about because I haven't seen the testing methodology. But your question is, would that that sort of knowledge is a good thing for people to have? Yes. Is there a a difference in in say a family taking a, a weekend trip in one of these homes or or, or camping out uh, in the homes as compared to someone living? Uh, in the homes for over a year. Dramatically different, yes, sir. Dramatically different. And have you documented any of the? Of no, that? but I mean, again, when, when we go back to when, what you're looking at exposure to environmental contaminants, which I have done for the last 25 years, you're looking at two basic things the intensity of exposure and the duration of exposure. Um, these units weren't designed or built for people to live in for two and a half years. Um, and somebody going with their fly rods with their children up to fish for a weekend. Uh, obviously, your duration of exposure is much less. And also, most of the time, those people are spending outside of the unit. They're outside, they're hiking, they're camping. If we're talking about these units being used on large lots where people who are living with their children 24 hours a day, both, both the intensity and duration of exposure is high. Thank you for your response, Doctor. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Would the gentleman yield? I yield to the gentleman uh, from California. Just uh, for full disclosure, uh, since you said it would be good for, for us to know, and I think you are right, uh, I want to reiterate that uh, in the room we are in right now, we are at 80 parts per billion based on measuring with your gold standard meter, so be uh, uh, parts per billion. So please be aware that you, you are breathing at that level, and if you need to leave, let us, let us know if, if anyone needs to leave early. So Thank what you. What sampling methodology was there? I don't know what sampling methodology yeah, what, that was, was a direct read instrument. What is the sampling methodology that we are being told? Uh, all it was the, the same about. methodology as Gulfstream and that was the reason that our staff did it uh, and, and got the uh, 40 to 80 depending upon what part of the capital you are in. Uh, I just wanted everyone to be aware that you know we could be off plus or minus 19 uh, percent but we do want people to know that this carpet apparently along with anything else that has been put in this uh, here over the years. Uh, that it, it emits, uh, we, you know, we apparently are well beyond the 16. It, uh, I think, it, I think full disclosure, you're absolutely right, Mr. Chairman. The people in the ante room will be relieved they're not here in the main room. Yeah. 
Gentleman's time has expired. All members of the uh, committee have asked questions, and Mr. Donnelly is with us, and I want to give him any opportunity he wishes to take at this point. I want to thank the chairman for uh, uh, letting me be present today, and I have, will submit a written statement for the record, and I want to thank the ranking member as well. And uh, I guess I want to thank the chairman also for inviting FEMA. I think FEMA's absence here uh, to explain their standards and their actions uh, that, that they really uh, have eliminated a part of the answer here, and, and I wish that they were in fact present. And, and Dr. McGeehan, what I want to ask you is when you did your testing for the trailers, did you do any comparison tests by taking trailers off the lots from places here in Maryland or Virginia that were built in regular production? We had, um, it depends on which, which you're talking about. The, uh, the occupied trailer study had parts of trailers in it that were off the lot. And the, the Lawrence Berkeley National Labs had two spec trailers and two off the lot trailers. Ones that were just being sold at uh, like Maryland trailer sales or, or, or nothing special that was built for, for uh, FEMA, but in fact was regular production. Off the lot trailers, that's my understanding. Yeah. Uh, did you test those? We did. They, they were part of both studies. Did you find any difference between off-the-lot trailers and trailers that were designed for FEMA? Well, let me just, I want to be cautious in, in this. Um, we did a study with Lawrence Berkeley that only had four trailers. And so therefore, I don't want to make any generalizations from this. We did look at the two spec trailers and the two off-the-lot trailers. And the two spec trailers um, on the whole, whole unit levels of formaldehyde were higher. And the two off-the-lot trailers were lower. But this study was not designed to look at that difference. And I don't want that generalized because that would be a mistake and it would be taking the science beyond what it was designed. Do you know of any different production standards for I don't know about trailers that. that were used for uh, families in Louisiana or Mississippi or trailers that were simply shipped to dealers who have been dealers for years of these companies? I, I have no knowledge about any separate manufacturing process for the spec trailers versus the off the lot. I don't know anything about that. Well, let me ask you this. Forty-four components were tested. Forty-five. Forty-five. Forty-four met all HUD standards. Right. Okay. And did FEMA provide, as far as you know, any standards to these companies in regards to formaldehyde to follow? It seems that everybody on the committee is more familiar with the correspondence between FEMA and the manufacturers than I am. Um, so I really can't answer that. I'm not aware of that. And you're all probably more aware of it than I. So you don't know of any standards that were, were violated in any way in regards I, to formaldehyde? I, I, I can't really comment on that. I, I don't know of anything about that at all. Well, let me ask you this. Um, in regards to the Tulane study, do you know anything unique that would have been about the site-built homes that were tested in that study? I do not know anything unique about the site-built homes. And the results of 370 parts per billion uh, is in fact higher than what some of the trailers were at. Isn't that correct? Oh, sure. Yes. So I, I guess one other question is why didn't we test site-built homes also? Well, there's been a number of very large studies that tested site-built homes around the country. Uh, well done, studies. In regards to the Katrina situation. Well, it doesn't have to be in regards to the Katrina situation. They are site-built homes and they were tested with uh, the same methodology that we used and those results are comparable. Well, well, what I'm asking is in regards to homes in the Katrina region at the same time that these trailers were down there, was there any test done to compare no. the levels of those homes as opposed to the levels of the trailers? No. The report is as it was 519 occupied FEMA supplied trailers. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Mr. Donnelly. Uh, Dr. McGeehan, thank you very much for your testimony. We very much appreciate it. And uh, if there are th further questions, we may submit them in writing to you for a response for the record. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, our, uh, our next uh, uh, panelists will uh, consist of the following individuals. Mr. Jim Shea, Jr. Mr. Shea is the chairman of Gulfstream Coach. He has been with Gulfstream for more than three decades and is responsible for the company's housing division. Mr. Steve Bennett is the president of Pilgrim International. Mr. Ronald 
Fennec is the President and Chief Executive Officer of Keystone RV. Keystone RV is a subsidiary of Thor Industries. And then Mr. Peter Legal. Mr. Legal is President of Forest River. He founded the company in 1996. I want to welcome each of you to our hearing today. Is Mr. Shea and Mr. Legal here? Mr. Legal is here. We want to welcome you to our hearing today. Your prepared statements will be put into the record in their, in their entirety. We uh, will ask uh, each of you to limit your oral presentation to five minutes. There's a, there's a um, little device on the table that will turn green for four minutes, yellow for the last minute, and then turn red when the time is up. And when you see that it's red, uh, you, you should realize your time is up and try to re make your concluding comments. It's the practice of this committee that all witnesses that testify before us do so under oath. So now that you're seated, if you would please rise and raise your right hand, I want to administer an oath to you. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony that you will give before the committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. A record will indicate that each of the witnesses answered in uh, the affirmative. Mr. Shea, why don't we start with you? There's a button on the base of the mic. Be sure to push that in so that uh, the um, microphone will pick up your, your statement. Good morning, Chairman Waxman, Ranking Member Davis. Sir. Yes. Sir. The light is on, yes. Okay, good. My name is Jim Shea, and I'm chairman of Gulfstream Coach. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss the travel trailers that our company produced and sold to FEMA. I have some brief opening remarks, but ask that my full statement be made part of the hearing record. Gulfstream is a small town American company committed to manufacturing quality recreational vehicles for its customers. Our travel trailers are built by hardworking, dedicated Americans in the heartland of our nation. Safety is a key component to our success. Just two days before Hurricane Katrina hit the Gulf Coast, Gulfstream received an urgent call from FEMA to provide 25,000 travel trailers to house possible hurricane victims. Gulfstream was prepared to meet FEMA's critical request because at the time we were the only manufacturer approved for well rail shipment of travel trailers. Almost every year since 1992, FEMA has purchased Gulfstream products from independent dealers to respond to natural disasters. In 2005, for the first time, FEMA contracted directly with Gulfstream to provide a total of 50,000 emergency travel trailers. It is important to note that FEMA's specifications did not include any requirement with respect to formaldehyde emission levels. The FEMA travel trailers we manufactured followed the same specifications as those we delivered to hurricane victims in 2004. In order to meet FEMA's urgent request, 
Gulfstream ramped up its production capacity and realigned its plant operations immediately upon receipt of the purchase order. We took special care to provide safe and quality product for the hurricane victims who temporarily were going to live in the travel trailers. Our FEMA units had four emergency egress windows instead of the required minimum of two. It was Gulfstream's practice to do additional life safety systems testing, including electrical, gas supply, smoke detection, and carbon monoxide detection beyond what we would do for our regular production for regular customers. In addition to what was routinely performed on units for the manufactured public, and FEMA inspectors were on site at our Indiana plants during the manufacturing process, and FEMA performed inspections at the hurricane zone staging areas. Furthermore, Gulfstream had representatives on site in Louisiana to do a, additional inspections after shipment. Today, just as when we produce travel trailers for FEMA, there are no federal standards governing formaldehyde in the manufacture of travel trailers. The lack of such a standard leaves our industry with no clear definitive guidance on the issue. Although there are still no formaldehyde standards for covering travel trailers, Gulfstream in 2007 voluntarily adopted the stringent product standard for formaldehyde emissions proposed by the California Air Resources Board. To our knowledge, Gulfstream is the first RV company to receive a third party certification of our applicable wood materials documentation, control processes, and related verification testing. Even without a federal standard, Gulfstream has had a long standing policy to purchase wood products that satisfy the HUD low formaldehyde emissions levels for manufactured housing, even though HUD standards do not apply to the manufacture of travel trailers. Several design aspects of our travel trailers also increase ventilation beyond what was required by the FEMA specifications. Gulfstream received the first complaint regarding formaldehyde concerning these FEMA travel trailers in March 2006. Obviously, we were concerned about the complaints and tried to be as proactive as possible by taking the following steps. First, we sought information regarding complaints received by FEMA. Second, we addressed the few complaints Gulfstream received regarding its travel trailers, but were instructed by FEMA in May 2006 not to directly contact trailer occupants. Third, we attempted to gather information on ways to identify and reduce ambient levels of formaldehyde through better ventilation solutions and processes. Fourth, we provided FEMA representatives with information related to ventilation of travel trailers and other measures to reduce formaldehyde levels for sensitive people. Fifth, we offered to participate with FEMA in joint testing of the travel trailers. FEMA did not accept our offer to do so. And sixth, we offered to share with FEMA the results of some informal, non-scientific screenings of FEMA-occupied travel trailers performed in late March and April 2006. FEMA did not accept our offer. Gulfstream has demonstrated its commitment to quality and safety for the residents from the beginning. Our, re our record shows that we were ready, willing, and able to assist FEMA with any resident concerns. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, on behalf of Gulfstream and our dedicated employees, that concludes my opening remarks. I'm happy to answer your questions. Members of the committee may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Shea. Mr. Bennett? I have no opening statement. No opening statement. Mr. Fennick? Is it Fennick or Fennich? It's Fennick. Fennick. Okay. I'm Fennick. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I think you ought to pull the mic a little closer. My name is Ron Fennick, and I'm proud to be here this morning to represent the 3,000 men and women who work assembling recreational vehicles for Keystone RV and our thousands of customers. After the Gulf Coast hurricanes of 2005, as with all Americans, our employees sympathized with the hundreds of thousands of people who overnight found themselves homeless. Emergency workers were faced with an incredible challenge as they scrambled to rescue survivors, account for the missing, to feed those in need, and there was an immediate and critical need for basic shelter. We have been invited here today to discuss the CDC findings regarding formaldehyde in trailers. When it comes to assessing safe levels of formaldehyde, there is no consistent government standards. And as the CDC itself stated in its February 2008 formaldehyde report, there is no specific level of formaldehyde that separates safe from dangerous. The recreational vehicle industry cannot address formaldehyde issue alone. It is much broader 
In fact, the materials that Keystone uses to assemble its trailers are generally the same types of materials used in home construction and can be found in local home improvement stores. We are looking to the government to evaluate the science and provide industry with a uniform standard. Once that standard has been developed, we hope the home construction industry will join us in adopting that standard. Together, these actions can lead to a workable national approach to this issue. We join with others in applauding the recent announcement by the EPA that they will conduct a comprehensive review and will, we hope, announce a clearly articula articulated standard that our industry and our suppliers can follow. And until then, we have not and we will not stand by idly. The Recreational Vehicle Industry Association, Association has recently announced compulsory standards that require manufacturers to build all units using CARB compliant wood by January 1, 2009 in CARB certified wood by July 1, 2010. And at Keystone, we intend to beat those deadlines. We have informed our suppliers that as quickly as possible, we will only purchase supplies that meet CARB standards. Hurricane Katrina was the worst natural disaster in the modern U.S. history. Hundreds of thousands of Americans needed temporary shelter, and I'm proud to say that our industry was part of the solution. And I sincerely hope that there will never again be another disaster that requires our vehicles to be used under such extreme conditions for such lengthy periods of time. But if there is, the lessons learned from this process will inform both industry and government to ensure a sound response to any need that may arise. So with that, I thank the committee for the opportunity to appear here today and to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Fennick. Mr. Legal. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. There's a button on the base. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and the members of the committee. My name is Peter Legal. I am president of Forest River. On behalf of more than 5,000 employees, thank you for the chance so we can tell you about what our company does. I'm especially proud to tell you how Forest River workers pitched in to help the victims of Hurricane Katrina. We started Forest River in 1996. It began in the part of Indiana where people of different backgrounds share a strong work ethic and what we call Hoosier values. We think that because of what we do, lots of American families are able to get closer to the outdoors and to travel and explore this great country. Today, 12 years later, we currently have 5,000 employees who work in more than 60 locations. Forest River has plants in Indiana, California, Michigan, Texas, Georgia, and Oregon. Last year, we built and sold over 100,000 units. We're still learning and we're still improving. Our folks still work hard and still care what they do. They cared in 2004 when, her when hurricanes hit Florida. Forest River employees built 800 units to FEMA specifications. And our folks were proud we never received a complaint about one of them. They cared in 2005 when Hurricane Katrina and Rita devastated the Gulf Coast. Like other Americans, Forest River employees wanted to help, and again they did. This time we were asked to build 35,000 RVs. We had to decide what made sense for our workers, our suppliers, our dealers, and our customers. So our team at Forest River came up with a production schedule that would allow us to build 5,000 trailers to help the victims. And Forest River workers built those trailers on the same production line, using the same materials, the same components, the same quality standards, the same inspectors, as they do for the product they build every day. The quality was the same as all the other units we build. The units we build for the Gulf Coast received the RBIA seal, because they met RBIA standards. Of course, our folks couldn't build these 5,000 units for free. Like every business, we have to pay our workers and our suppliers. We have to earn enough to keep things going, but we never thought about charging higher prices. We sold the FEMA trailers at the same modest profit levels as our normal sales. Our overall profit that year was about the same as it was in the years before and the years after Katrina. Today, Hearing involves formaldehyde. We all know there is some formaldehyde in wood products, carpeting, fabrics used in the RVs. It is also used in building homes, apartments, and office buildings. We all agree we don't want formaldehyde, or for that matter, any other substance, to reach levels where it is a serious health threat. 
Most of us aren't doctors or scientists, and those people who are doctors and scientists don't agree on the level of formaldehydes that are safe or not safe. There isn't an agreement on how to measure formaldehyde levels. No one has all these answers yet. Certainly I don't, but what I can tell you is Forest River's experience. First, formaldehyde has not historically been an issue. Over the dozen years we've been in business, we have made and sold over one million units. Out of those million plus units, I think we only had three instances where customer concerns actually required our testing of the vehicles. In two of the cases, the formaldehyde level tested quite low. In the third, it was pretty clear at the end of the day that whatever the problem was coming from, it wasn't on the manufacturer's end. Given that experience, literally less than a handful of instances of this sort out of a million units, I think you can understand why I say that formaldehyde has not historically been an issue with Forest River products and customers. The second point is we have not been sitting idly by, waiting for doctors and scientists to, to figure out the answers. We may not know the answers, but we know that it can't hurt by moving closer to the California stricter formaldehyde standard for wood products even before it was recommended in the industry, which we have done. In closing, I want to thank you again for, be, uh, for you allowing us to share Forest River's story. Our employees are proud of the product we make and a the company they have helped build. I must also tell you, candidly, that many of our workers are now confused and hurt at the charges about the quality of RVs. <coughs> Excuse me, but they know when it comes to Forest River products, Nothing could be further from the truth. But I think they also have the faith, as I do, that responsible people will be fair and will make their decisions on fact. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and the committee for uh, letting me tell you my story. I'll answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Mr. Legal. We're now going to recognize members uh, to ask questions uh, for five minutes apiece, and I'll start off the questions. Uh, Mr. Shea, I wrote to Gulfstream in uh, February, on February 14th of this year, and I asked your company's help in understanding why a Gulfstream uh, travel trailer sold to FEMA would have high levels of formaldehyde. And I want to read what uh, Gulfstream said in response to my question on March 7th. Here's what they said. Gulfstream respectfully disagrees with the premise of the committee's question, i.e., that formaldehyde levels in the trailers it sold to FEMA following the Gulf Coast hurricanes of 2005 were high. Now, given what we know now, I, I find this response astonishing. In March 2006, trailer occupants began to complain about formaldehyde. On March 21, 2006, Stephen Miller of FEMA emailed your brother Dan Shea and asked him if Gulfstream had, quote, the capability to put this to bed end quote. Were you aware of this email? Yes, sir. Okay. Be sure to push the button on the mic. Uh, yes, sir. Your brother responded that he would send a person to Baton Rouge to test units. From the end of March until May 2006, Gulfstream Vice President Scott Pullen tested FEMA trailers. He tested approximately 50 trailers, including 11 Occupy trailers. Mr. Pullen's test indicated formaldehyde levels at or above 100 parts per billion within every occupied trailer, travel trailer he tested. Four of the 11 occupied trailers had levels above 500 parts per billion. Mr. Poland also tested over 25 new Gulf Coast trailer, travel trailers that had not yet been deployed for displaced residents, and over 10 of these trailers contained formaldehyde levels in excess of 900 parts per billion. One Gulfstream trailer had formaldehyde levels of 2,690 parts per billion. In 2006, Gulfstream knew better than anyone that formaldehyde levels in the trail, travel trailers it made for FEMA were high. And just last week, the Centers for Disease Control confirmed that even in the winter of 2007 and 2008, 56 percent of Gulfstream's travel trailers at elevated levels of formaldehyde. I have one question for you, Mr. Stray, uh, Mr. Shea. Do you still disagree that formaldehyde levels in FEMA's Gulf 
stream trailers were high? Well, Mr. Chairman, when I review the CDC report, the most recent CDC report on occupied trailers, I see that our levels of occupied units fell I, I, in the intermediate we can't hear you, range, so, sir. We cannot hear you. So pull the microphone closer. If it's on, be sure the button is pushed. Uh, the uh, light is on, sir. Okay. Yes, I, I would just like to repeat, sir, mm -hmm. that what we saw in the occupied unit testing that the CDC did was that our units fell in what they would term the intermediate level. But how about your own testing? We did not do testing, sir. We did do, we used an informal device, a screening device. It's not a scientific device. It's not accepted by NIOSH. It's not accepted by any organization. It could have been used by anyone, any company, any agency. It's not testing, sir. It's a screening device that picks up many other uh, components, but chemical components. It's whatever not testing. That device, whatever the validity was of that test, it certainly gave you an indication of very high levels of formaldehyde in your own trailers, didn't it? Well, let me tell you, we were a proactive company, sir, and one of the first things we did, in fact, Mr. Pullen, a longtime technical employee, vice president of this company, was, went into the field, was in the field on other matters, and he conversed and talked to other occupants, to varied trailer residents. And he asked them what their uh, experience was, and they said they were very happy with their trailers. They weren't having any problems. They were enjoying their trailers. There were no issues. Well, now, did. at the time that he did that, he did quickly take a snapshot deployment with this tool. It was not screening. It was not testing. It was a quick snapshot. It would have reflected anything that the residents would have done in the unit at the time. And I have to remind you that they were not complaining. There were not symptoms. He also Well, you went did get some complaints. We because had, I just read the, 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 one of the complaints, and in fact, one of the people said, please, please, please help me. I've got, I've got this formaldehyde, and, it, and it's causing problems in my breathing, to paraphrase it. Yes, sir. I'd like and, to uh, and notwithstanding that, you, you did the testing, and then you told FEMA you didn't get any complaints, and you told them you got some test results, but you didn't tell them what they were. They didn't ask. You told them if they asked, that you'd share it. But your own test results showed high levels of formaldehyde. Yes, I'd like to set the record straight there, sir. We, we communicated with FEMA. We, actually, we asked FEMA, do you have any complaints? We wanted to assist. We wanted to visit people. We wanted to, to uh, lend whatever we could for sensitive in individuals. We had three complaints come in directly to ourselves in that March period after the new, initial news reports. And we investigated all three of them. And then in mid-March, and, and after we'd asked FEMA for, for what complaints they had, which they directed two people to us, two of those people, none of them had formaldehyde complaints. What they had was one what complained on odor from a, a, a improperly hooked up sewer. The other was concerned about Mr. wanting to buy her unit. And she had security concerns. Those are the two complaints that we well, received Shea, from FEMA. My, my time is up, but I do want to tell you that if you've done some kind of testing and you see the kind of high levels, even over 2,000 parts per billion in some of your trailers, the, the response, I think, of a responsible businessman should have been to, f to test further, to find out what's going on, to uh, take some kind of responsible action and not to come before Congress and say, FEMA didn't tell me they had complaints. Of course, they didn't know what you knew. And therefore, uh, you didn't have to do any more testing yourself, even though you got these alarming results. That's what you didn't do. You didn't, you didn't do more tests. You didn't tell FEMA there's a problem. And you didn't take the action that I would think would be the responsible action of a responsible business. I would love to respond to that, sir. So there's a difference here between testing and screening. There's a difference between unoccupied units and occupied units. We did unoccupied unit screening to better be able to inform FEMA how to properly ventilate units. We also were uh, utilizing some optional devices that we were using in the uh, unoccupied screenings because we could generally screen for the how indoor air quality changes. And I would remind you there are many components, as, as uh, Dr. McGeehan said, in indoor air. Uh, this, this unit would have been sensitive to many of them. So what we were unable to do is we could advise FEMA better. Our, our council asked us to make sure what we said to FEMA was as accurate as possible. We 
tested these, the performance of the ventilation systems that we would provided with the unit, plus some optional systems to help with sensitive individuals. And there is a difference between what we did with occupied units versus the screenings of unoccupied units. I'm going to, my time is over and I'm just going to say it sounds like you handled it very carefully as a public relations and as a legal problem. But I think you had more of a responsibility to the health of the people that were living in your trailers. Mr. Davis? I would yield my five minutes to Mr. Sauter. Uh, and I would ask the Chairman to be generous uh, if I go over just a little bit as well. Um, uh, first I want to welcome all of you uh, as fellow Hoosiers and uh, having huge uh, facilities in my district and in uh, employing lots of people who are getting uh, already hundreds losing their jobs because of uh, the gas prices, the mileage restrictions, the ability to get vehicles that can tow. Ten percent of Americans have some sort of vehicle. Most are from uh, northern Indiana and Congressman Donnelly in my districts. Uh, and uh, it's, it's uh, uh, the danger of how we do something like this is, is as our guys try to meet these standards, follow whatever the government says, you have the inspectors on your sites, we just push these kind of jobs to China uh, where they don't meet these kind of inspections, where they aren't, there's no conscience and we wonder why we lose American jobs. Uh, that it, it, is, it is incredibly frustrating. We all want to find out what the truth is. Uh, Mr. Mr. Shea, um, is FEMA, uh, weren't they at the plants all day? I'm, I'm sorry, sir. The, weren't they at your facilities all day? Yes, during the course of our production, as I understand that um, because we were a direct manufacturer, they had a, an inspector in each plant every day receiving units as they came offline and, and, and inspecting them. Without getting into uh, uh, confidential information, and I'm not asking you to disclose this, but the type of test you did on these trailers, how expensive was it to, do, to take the the desiccator test that you did that's not the gold standard, that has a wide variation of accuracy. Um, yes, this, this is a, a device, it's called a, a formellimeter. It's, um, it's uh, not a scientific tool. It's not really what they would call a desiccator test, which is another imprecise um, type of testing. No, this is a quick snatch method and it's just a screening tool. If you look in the directions to the piece of equipment, it's a screening tool. It doesn't claim to be a testing tool. It tells you that there's other components that it absorbs. Our individual wasn't experienced in using it. It did provide some benefit in terms of seeing how indoor air changes occurred, but it's certainly not testing. And we, we didn't employ that, uh, certainly at, at our plant location with FEMA inspectors. There was no issue about that. It was never an issue with FEMA inspectors. This was during the time when we were producing these units. Would this been an expensive test for FEMA to conduct? Well, well, anybody could have used one of these devices, any organization. You know, uh, FEMA did OSHA testing in the uh, fall of 2005, so they were familiar with um, closed up units, unoccupied units. They did more OSHA testing, uh, I think the record shows, in March, uh, late March, after this became an issue. So, and I think those uh, results are available. And, and, and those, so they knew what closed up, sealed up, units that have been cycled to 80 to 100 degrees of hot boxes would do. I mean, any, any structure that was closed up, even a house that was closed up and sealed up and cycled to 80, 100 degrees would have decreased indoor or air quality. There's just no two ways about it. Well, this, the scary thing about uh, if we're not careful in hearings and we aren't trying to, to, to look at fundamental questions with, with accurate science, one of our, our challenges here is, is that um, uh, I met with nine of the ten companies named in the early lawsuit. Total, they had the three complaints that you had talked about. Uh, that um, then the lawsuit started, and all of a sudden legal liability starts. Now you're being criticized for doing a very simple test that could have been done by the government, and the question comes: What employer or company in America is going to expose themselves? to voluntary uh, cooperation if this is the end result. That, that the proliferation of suits all over America right now uh, that and, uh, you know, people say, well, I, I heard in Katrina, I read in the newspaper, I heard on TV 
not, not on any science as we're learning. We, the, the 390 parts uh, per billion, and we keep sliding between parts per million, parts per billion. Uh, you don't have any standards. You're, you're trying to cooperate. Instead, you get your head beat in. Do you plan to ever deal with the government again? Sir, this is a, an incredible quandary. We've seen a specification. It's not a standard put forth by FEMA in their latest standards. It's 16 parts per billion. Of course, very recent studies with new technology show that this is in, within the range of human breath. This is within the range of normal human breath, what people normally breathe out from their normal metabolism, irrespective of what's in the air. Well, how can a company, why would a company take on that kind of liability? It would be so easy for something to occur either naturally or, or from use sources that would double or triple this, this specification they accept. This company would never take that liability on, sir. Within the broad definitions of five minutes, I have one more supplemental question. You've done FEMA uh, before. It, it has been a significant part of your business. Yes, we've done it since uh, we've provided units through um, d uh, dealerships since 1992. FEMA came directly to us and asked us for a direct quotation and proposal at the beginning of this hurricane, before the hurricane actually actually hit New Orleans. Thank you, Mr. Souter. Your time has expired. Uh, Mr. Cummings? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Shay, uh, you know, I know the Chairman uh, referenced uh, a letter from a lady <coughs> where she said, and I quote, there is an odor in my trailer that Mr. will Chairman. not go away. M Mr. It Chairman. burns my eyes and I'm M getting headaches every day. Uh, I have tried many things, but nothing seems to work. Please, please help me. Uh, you're familiar with that, are you not? Shay? It would be helpful to me to see the exact customer that you refer to, sir, uh, that would refresh well, my memory. Well, you heard the words. Would, if, that was your, uh, is that, if that was your wife, would you be concerned about her living in a trailer? I can give you the letter that we responded to, sir, to uh -huh. uh, FEMA. When we got that report and we communicated with FEMA, my recollection is it was with regard to a Mr. Reeser. Okay. Here's what we said, if I could quote. If, with Very briefly, because I've got a lot of questions okay, in yes, a little sir. bit of time. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I do, not want to, I do want to take the opportunity to reinforce our position previously communicated to FEMA that Gulfstream is ready, willing, and able to work with FEMA with regard to any complaint, including sending a representative within 24 hours to work with your contractors to inspect, Good, test, I got you. or do whatever okay. is reasonably necessary Mr. to address Shea, the complaint. You, you, you lead, you're coming right where I want you to be because I want to talk about some of your correspondence, and, and, and not in addition to what you just read. Um, I'd like to share with you what Gulfstream disclosed to FEMA, and I know you're related to, uh, for me with this, related to formaldehyde in its travel trailers in May 2006. It's been referenced quite a bit here. And Gulfstream sent a letter to FEMA and it said, and I quote, we wanted to follow up on our, our recent conversations regarding the travel trailer supply to FEMA. We would like to reiterate our willingness to assist you in addressing any concerns about our products. Our informal testing has indicated formaldehyde levels of indoor ambient air uh, uh, of occupied trailers fall below, for, for instance, the OSHA standard uh, 0.75 parts per million, 70, 750 parts per billion. We are willing to share these informal test results with you. And as mentioned during our meeting, if FEMA wishes to conduct formal testing protocols on any designated units, we are willing to participate in that testing. Now, you spent a lot of time, I'm sure, on drafting that letter. The documents uh, that, w that we received show that you spent over a month getting the wording right. How do you interpret your own letter? And are you saying that your testing showed a formaldehyde problem? Or are you saying that your testing did not show uh, a problem? Well, sir, going back to the framework of the time, uh, there was two regula regulatory standards that I was familiar with. One was the OSHA permissible exposure level for workers that would be exposed for, for their working life. The other was the HUD target regulatory level. Those were the two. Those are the two now. There was one that came up in the press that was referenced as a 0.1 EPA, quote, safety level by some activist groups. But when I looked that up, it said, above this level, sensitive individuals may experience symptoms. It wasn't a safety level. And I did ask some experts, was, did EPA have a standard? 
E they told me that EPA didn't have an outdoor standard for formaldehyde at the time. It didn't have an indoor standard for formaldehyde at the time. So, so in, ter in terms of how now you, you understand how that before you sent that letter, that the CDC had said that they thought that the levels of 100 were dangerous. Is uh, you, you you knew that, right? You didn't know that. I, I see I, people shaking their heads I, behind you. I have you, no but. recollection of this. The CDC came out with their interim report and took a position. Their original ATSDR position was that after the EPA testing that was done in the fall was that 0.3 parts per million was acceptable. They changed that later, but that was well after this time, sir. That was in, that was in uh, 2007. That was in like February of 2007 after EPA did testing of unoccupied units in uh, September of 06. So this is not corrected on April 24, 2006. Gulf Streams outside council sent both Jim and Dan Shea a 1997 document cre created by the Consumer Pro uh, Product Safety Commission entitled, uh, quote, an update on formaldehyde. The document included the following information. Formaldehyde is a color, str uh, strong smelling gas when present in air at levels above 0.1 ppm. Uh, it can cause watery eyes, uh, burning sensations in the eyes and nose and throat, nausea, coughing, chest tightening, wheezing, sick skin rashes and allergic reactions. You're saying that's not accurate? Is that what you're saying? That's the, the language that came off of the uh, EPA sensi uh, sensitivity recommendation, uh -huh. as I recall, sir. That's for sensitive individuals. And we've always been concerned to help with any individuals that had sensitivities. We know that there are sensitive people, sir. All right. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much. Your, your time has expired. Mr. Burton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this home test kit, this uh, formaldehyde, how accurate is that? Well, sir, it, it, it varies. It, it can be up and down. It's, if you sprayed um, an air freshener and then took a test, it would, or took a screening, it would be eight parts per million sometimes. It's reactive to ethanol, methanol, phenol all kinds of things. It's an indicator of air flows, ventilation, but in terms of absolute testing, so nobody would accept it. For NIOSH doesn't accept it. It's not acceptable in a court of law. It's sub, it's, some people so. may be more accurate than others. Our, our individual wasn't well trained in this or, or trained in calibrating it. So it, it was a, it's an indicator, but it's not really scientific. It's, it's an indicator that formaldehyde is likely present. Now, in these uh, 11 uh, uh, units that were, were checked, with the formaldehyde, there were four that were above 500, but the other seven were below that, below the mm. uh, 500 level. That's correct, sir. But that wasn't scientific. No, it wasn't scientific, and, and of course we recognize that if anybody had smoked a cigarette an hour before or cooked or something, that influences the level. But um, what our main thing was. These people were very happy. One person was described by Mr. Pullen as being ecstatic that he finally had a place where he could go to, a refuge, something that was air conditioned, a totally self-contained living unit. And uh, everyone was happy. There were some people that were older people. There were some young children, toddler age. They were happy with their units. They were not complaining about their units. They were not experiencing symptoms. We went back in that proximate time to, to or Mr. Pullen did, to revisit with these people in that late April period uh, before we, we uh, asked FEMA to come in and talk, uh, and, 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 and talk to them further about these, these um, uh, uh, convassing that we did. Well, I, I, you know, I, I, I don't think you can answer this question, any of you, but if I took a, a HUD-produced house, a HUD-funded house, an awful lot of them around this country right now that are vacant, and you closed it up, and you left it closed in very hot weather for, say, a couple of weeks or longer, would the, would the uh, parts per billion be uh, equivalent to what you saw in a mobile home manufacturing well, house? I, I do know this, sir. Any structure, if you close it up, seal it up, cycle the temperature to 80 to 100 degrees, you're going to have a reduction in indoor air quality. There will be higher levels of content, chemical constituents, especially if you have attached garage with a car in it. I just went to a lean building seminar. The presenter said one of the best things you could do for indoor air quality was to have a detached garage. So any structure, if you put it under these kind of conditions, is going to have decreased indoor air quality. And you use, use the kind of materials that are used in, in just about any kind of construction in these in these. Uh, if you go, you know, the, the, 
the highest users of these composite wood products like particle board, MDF, uh, hardwood plywoods. If you look at the reports, most of it goes into the remodeling industry. If you go into these large remodeling stores, these products are stacked to the ceiling. So, so the so RV industry and the manufactured housing use in, all, industry only use less than 1% of these so, kind of but, products. Uh, the point I'm trying to make is that you're, you're not using anything out of the ordinary in producing these, these products. You're, doing, you're using what's normal in, in construction. So these, these products are used in furniture making, yeah. cabinetry, home building. Well, let, let me just say I'm going to yield to my colleague, uh, Mr. Issa from, Issa from California, but I just want to say I've known the Shea family uh, probably for 30 years. And I know their business. And Mr. Chairman, I want you to know they have impeccable credentials as far as conducting their business in an honorable way in Indiana. I don't represent that area, but I want you to know that I don't think they would ever do anything intentionally to harm uh, the health of any individual. With that, I yield to Mr. Eisen. I thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Bennett, how many uh, people does your company employ typically? Uh, right now, we. Right now, we employ approximately 100 people. About 100. And Mr. Shea, how many would you have had at the peak of, uh, of production for FEMA? How many people would you have employed? Uh, I would estimate about uh, 2,000 people, sir. About 2,000. So we're looking at companies of 5,000, 3,000, 100, and 2,000. And I've noticed that uh, in the information I've received, we only have two people who have made complaints, both about uh, your company, Mr. Shea, and they seem to be about only one thing, which is the question about Norboard being made in China and, and that being the source of a lot of this uh, uh, problems. Uh, earlier, people talked about imported Chinese products. Do you know where Norboard is made? And uh, do you know if it could be the cause of the problem? Uh, Norboard is an MDF product that's made in Deposit, New York. It's an American product. Um, it's uh, made to a, what they call an ANSI standard, which is equivalent to the HUD uh, standard for particle board. But we asked uh, this company to provide testing documentation on their product. And their product actually tests well below the standard that they, they build to. It's actually about over 30 percent below uh, the standard. And it's almost what the upcoming CARB standard is for MDF that's upcoming for 2009. It's very close to that. So this was good product, good American <laughs> product. And, uh, and uh, I don't know what this individual was referring to relative Gen to Thank you, Mr. Chairman. time has expired. We'll come back to you, Mr. Ice, in a minute. Uh, Mr. Danny Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Shea, let me try and make sure I understand uh, your testimony. Uh, how many Katrina-related uh, trailers did your company build and supply to FEMA during this process? Uh, sir, we had uh, two contracts. Each was for 25,000 uh, units, sir. Did you actually build and supply or sell to FEMA those 25,000 units? Uh, yes, we did, sir. Did I understand you to suggest or to say that prior to the CNN news report that you had only heard of possibly three expressions of concern, one which turned out to be a faulty connection of a sewer line? Sir, I'm not sure as far as the CNN report. The time frame that I was referring to was, between, was a report that came out of Bay St. Louis on an individual that was in one of our units. And we contacted FEMA on that individual. They told us, because we wanted to assist or see what we could do, they said that they had they couldn't discuss it for privacy reasons with us, but that they had addressed his concerns by exchanging for a different trailer. Now, I'm not including that, that customer, sir, but... Okay, but you had no, no, no information that would suggest that formaldehyde was a problem in any of these units. Be before the report that came from Bay St. Louis, we had not had, this had not been an issue uh, that, that we had had to deal with with any FEMA units, our travel trailers, it, it, it has not been this kind of a, a concern. Um, so this was surprising to us, very surprising to us when this became an issue in, in the state of Mississippi at that time. All right. Thank you. Let me, let me ask you, Mr. Legal, how many 
trailers did your company supply to FEMA? We supplied 5,000 to uh, 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 FEMA specs, not directly to FEMA, but through a, 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 a government-approved government uh, purchaser. And uh, so 5,000 to the FEMA specs, but we also know that FEMA had bought trailers of Forest River off of dealer's lots. And Let me just ask if I under, did I understand also that you were actually invited or there was some discussion that you could supply 35,000? That is correct. And you decided not to do that the is 35? Also could you tell us why? Well, number one, we couldn't. Doing what we were told to do by FEMA, they wanted our units to be built in the same standards that we build our typical RV. And so to, to, to do that, we had to use the same plants, the same people, the same materials, et cetera, et cetera. And that the most we could build was 5,000 in the time period they needed them. So you were afraid that you might have to compromise something if you were to attempt to take on that contract? Yes, sir. Um, the 5,000 that you actually built and sold, did you make any profit different than the profit that you probably would have made if you sold those to the Danny Davis Enterprises? <laughs> no. Uh, the margin of profit would have been about approximately the same what we made the year before and the years after. Let me ask each one of you gentlemen if you would uh, answer directly. Um, last week, the CDC issued a report about the results of its testing and ultimately ended up suggesting that people living in any of these trailers exceeding 500 parts per billion, that they actually ought to be moved out and that they ought to move out immediately. Let me ask if you agree with that statement, and beginning with you, Mr. Shea. Well, sir, I, I don't recall that 500, uh, my understanding on, on the CDC was they really didn't define a level of when people should move out. Okay, they so just you recommended couldn't comment people on the statement that I just made because you wouldn't be aware of it. Let me go to the next gentleman. I'd have to say that uh, until a standard is agreed upon, then that's a difficult question to answer. All right, so it's difficult. Let me go to the next. Mr. Fennick? Yes. <laughs> uh, try, please uh, ask the question again, sir, because I don't want to. Well, let me, just, let, me just, let me just ask this. If you purchase an apple and cannot eat it, do you believe that you ought to pay for it? Great question. No, I'd probably not want to pay for that apple. Well, my point is this, that if there were trailers that people can't live in now, that FEMA has purchased, should the taxpayers be paying for those trailers that cannot be used for the purposes for which they were purchased? I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Give back the balance of my time. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Issa. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Davis, uh, I, I would be interested to know whether or not we would make more money on your purchase than on FEMA's purchase. That, that could be a whole separate hearing. But I am selling apples. <laughs> well, you know, and we don't know today, unfortunately, whether or not this is an example of 50,000, 125,000 apples being bought and we have a couple of bad apples. Uh, I would. Uh, I want to have several questions, but I would. I would want to make sh sure we understand here today. There is no test going on in every one of these trailers in the field. There is no standard if there was a test. So, to, and CDC just told us that in fact they only are looking for looked at one item, and there is no standard for what level we should move people out of uh, these trailers or how much ventilation uh, would be enough to reduce it. Uh, and they weren't familiar with the high levels inside fixed homes uh, in, in, the, in these areas of the South, particularly Louisiana. So having said that, uh, I'm going to look at you four business people and I'm going to try and 
I'm not saying provide your relief. I think that uh, you'll provide that for yourself uh, in due course. But uh, lest you be the last victims of a Katrina, let's just put it that way. Today, do any of you have a standard in front of you, other than the proposed standard, uh, that would cause you to make your trailers different? In other words, has FEMA come back to you, uh, other than this adopting of 16 parts per billion, and given you any new guidance on how to make trailers if, in fact, a hurricane hits today? Okay, and I'll take no as the answer, no, right? No. And Mr. Sh Mr. Lee, no, I think I saw no from everyone. Mr. No, Shea, sir. in your case, speaking about trying to hit this uh, level of uh, parts per billion that's roughly equal to inhaling and exhaling and dramatically less than if one cat pees on the carpet, uh, uh, which would be far greater parts per billion just based on a, a kitty accident. Uh, the only thing you know of is something that could cause you to say no bid. Is that correct? That, that if in fact 16 parts per billion becomes the standard, you're going to have to no bid it because you can't re meet that standard. No, sir, because of even if you tested something in where we produce in Indiana, by the time you moved it to Louisiana, totally different atmospherics, much more humidity, much more heat on a constant right. basis, there's no way. And, and that doesn't even include how residents differ in, in their use. But, you know, I'm an electronics manufacturer, so uh, my background is one in which we have standards for absolutely everything. And I was, uh, uh, I was the chairperson of the Standard and, and Trade Association, the Consumer Electronics Association, before I came to Congress. Now, you all four are, I believe, you're all members of the Trade Association for Travel Trailers. Is that correct? Yes. Correct. Okay. And is your association prepared to participate in standard setting if, in fact, the government is willing to set standards? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Do you know if your association has reached out uh, to try to have that engagement? Uh, yes, any one of you wants to speak? I think that's all. very important to the industry, and they've said so. They're very interested in being able to have the kind of standard they can conform to, and, and I, I'm sure they will be leading the parade as far as, as, as attaining that standard. So again, in the spirit of less we have uh, Katrina have one more set of victims, all of you are saying today that you do not have new standards on which to make trailers differently than you've made them before and after Katrina. The only discussion of a new standard, the 16 parts per billion, is not achievable. And your association stands ready to work with, on a uniform basis, meeting these standards both for FEMA and, and for the, the matter of fact, the consumer public. Is that all correct? Absolutely. Yes. So we've, we've hauled you all in here to talk about a standard that didn't ex exist, that you couldn't meet because it didn't exist. It doesn't exist today. And we're asking you to defend yourselves because you might have made a profit making uh, trailers that in many cases were identical or actually were off-the-shelf trailers because many of what FEMA bought were off-the-shelf trailers. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Correct. Okay. I, uh, and I yield the remainder of my time to Mr. I just Burton. want to ask the uh, your mic is. I was wondering if we could uh, could ask uh, the EPA uh, to uh, test closed houses in this area down there to see what the uh, parts per billion are uh, in those houses compared to these motor homes that were there uh, since Katrina. I, I think that would be a, a very interesting thing, and I'd like to ask you, Mr. Chairman, if we could request that kind of a uh, a study. Well, I'll certainly take it under uh, submission, but certainly you're free to ask for any uh, information you want. Well, I know, but you being chairman, I think it would carry a, a, I'll co, co request it with you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, time has expired. Ms. Dorton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Mr. Shea, uh, uh, my question really goes to the, the duty of the manufacturer. You've, we've spoken about FEMA here. But, uh, you don't have to worry about FEMA. I'm chair of the subcommittee with jurisdiction over FEMA. This committee has, in addition, had FEMA before us way before we ever got to you over the past uh, couple of years. I, uh, my, my questions really go to, to uh, the duty to disclose in a free, um, democratic, free market society. Uh, when, when a business wants to avoid liability, when a business wants to remain in business, when a business 
wants to maintain its reputation with the federal government and with customers uh, generally. Uh, and I'm, I'm perplexed by your approach to the 35 unoccupied trailers. I uh, have a letter here from March 2006, uh, a, a letter uh, from Gulfstream, um, where Gulfstream was testing 35 unoccupied uh, trailers. Now, these tests leave aside the controversy about no standard, what standard. These tests showed levels in some of these trailers well over 2,000 to 4,000 <laughs> per billion. And I don't think there's much controversy about that level by anyone's standards. Uh, that is a dangerous standard, and I don't think that that is subject to uh, dispute or has been subject to dispute even here. Um, now, Mr. Shea, you began testing in March, and FEMA, of course, was still in the process of activating its purchase of, of trailers. Um, and indeed, after March 2006, when you were testing, uh, FEMA actually continued to activate trailers thousands, which of course ended uh, up uh, in the Gulf uh, with the results that are uh, under scrutiny here today. Um, let me ask you, um, did a Gulfstream provide FEMA with the vehicle identification numbers of the trailers that it had tested that had high levels of formaldehyde so that, at the very least, FEMA could ensure that those trailers were not distributed uh, on the Gulf Coast? Well, there's various emails that I think if you look in the, in the records, you'll see discussions between FEMA and, uh, and emails between FEMA and Gulfstream. Well, we have your letter, and your letter makes no reference to any results from the unoccupied trailers. Is it your testimony that you, in fact, told FEMA, emailed FEMA, wrote FEMA uh, about the results in the 35 unoccupied trailers? Did you reveal these 2,000 to 4,000 parts per billion in the unoccupied trailers? I'm simply trying to get whether you did or not. And we Before you wrote, wrote we, back, did you we disclose this information yeah, we, or not? We didn't conclude that it was relevant, ma'am. We thought it was irrelevant information. In, 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 in what sense? Well, sir, or, I'm sorry, ma'am. We felt it was irrelevant information because, first of all, we provided information to, to um, FEMA in that letter relative to what our experience was with ventilation, what our experience was in looking at ventilation options for sensitive individuals. Well, that's that was my the point. important you thing. You provided, indeed, in, this, <laughs> in, 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 in this, this letter, you provided uh, only the information that, of course, would reinforce the continuing purchase uh, and activation of these trailers. I understand what you provided. I'm <laughs> asking you why you thought it was irrelevant yes, to I'd disclose to to any that. information about the, uh, about the uh, formaldehyde levels in the unoccupied uh, trailers which you yourself were at that moment testing. Why was that irrelevant? Well, first of all, FEMA had information on unoccupied units, ma'am. They'd done OSHA testing I'm in November. I'm talking about your, your tests. You just said irrelevant. Yes. We, and we I want to know why it's irrelevant. It's, ir it's irrelevant, ma'am, because FEMA knew about closed up, tightened up, heated up units, what, 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 they, were, uh, what they would have been uh, testing at, because they had NIOSH testing, NIOSH certified persons that went out and did testing these, well these before this. These were unoccupied this. trailers about to be distributed to actual human beings on the Gulf Coast. Did you believe, uh, if you had to do it over again, would you disclose the information on the 35 unoccupied trailers to FEMA? Anything that would have been helpful to public health in, in any kind of retrospect on this, we would, have, we would have loved to have been able to shed more light on. You know, we support public 
health. We, but this is looking at it in retrospective, and our perspective at the time was well, you, the, haven't the, test, you haven't been able to tell us why it was irrelevant. Indeed, you testified well, that make, in retrospect, if I could con conclude, in retrospect, uh, this could have been helpful to, to maintain uh, health. And, and I, I, you know, my m main concern here is not so much with what appears to be a cover-up, at least of this information, but with whether or not uh, the companies have learned anything from this experience. I don't, uh, your, your notion that it's, I will try, I will try to conclude that your first answer about irrelevant is not your final answer and that if you had to do it over again, perhaps it should have been disclosed. That's giving you the best, uh, that's giving you the best uh, veneer I can on your answer. I yield back the, the balance of my time. Gentlelady's time has expired. Uh, who is next? Mr. Souter. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman, and, and uh, I have a couple of points I want to make, but I want to follow up there, uh, Mr. Shea, in the, these were, it was not a scientific test, it was a snapshot. And it was a snapshot of sealed, sealed vehicles which could test at any different range. Um, that in retrospect, perhaps it would have been helpful for CDC to know, but in fact, they probably wouldn't have had it be relevant either other than potentially to do more testing because the test wasn't accurate. Isn't that what you were trying to say? Yes, and if you'll remember, the EPA did testing, certified testing, in several months after we would have done these screenings in September. And they showed levels above these levels, equal to these levels that were shown by the screenings, which of course picked up all kinds of other chemical constituents. But it wasn't treated by government as being relevant. They didn't say because we have these closed up, heated up, sealed up units at these levels, they didn't come back and say, well, everybody needs to be evacuated from units. What they, you would what have they, certainly said air them out. They, they, they said air them out, and the ATSDR did a report in February 2007. It wasn't until occupied unit testing was done, 18 months after this <coughs> approximately letter that Ms. Norton is referring to, that, that there was a move to what the CDC C said, quickly relocate residents. It wasn't after this, this EPA testing that was done well before that, that, that showed results in these sealed up units. I, I wanted to make a, a comment and uh, if any of you want to add to this, there's a kind of a misunderstanding in applying the type of industry that's developed predominantly in Elkhart County from, from other industry associations and why the industry hasn't been more proactive. It's basically a startup industry that was a collection of small companies. Mr. Legal, when you started, how, how, what size was your company? Well, when we began, it was in 96 and uh, probably began with 20, 30 people. And Forest River is now one of the biggest. How many acquisitions would you say you've made in the last 24 months? Acquisition. Yeah, in other words, picking up other facilities. Uh, we primarily grew from uh, being organically grown and not uh, through acquisition. Mr. Finnick, you, Keystone came out of other uh, companies in the area. and It was one of the most dynamic young companies. Thor now has bought a whole number of companies in the district, in, including yours. Um, that Mr. Bennett's historically has been more typical, a uh, fairly small company uh, that as government pressure comes in and as we have more accountability, one of the byproducts of this is it's getting harder and harder for somebody to start a company of 90 employees or harder and harder to, to do what Keystone did uh, without the capital meeting all the different standards. And there are consequences to our actions, but in the, the ability of the association to fund their own R&D, that um, what we've seen is a consolidation of this industry into larger companies because as you have to do this, you, you respond differently. And one of the great entrepreneurial counties, Elkhart County is the highest percent manufacturing in America, one of the last percent places. And Mr. Shea, your company, and one other thing that's come up, I've seen it in the media reports of shuttered buildings. I know another company which is not this, but Utilimaster, 
when I first visited them, sometimes they're operating in two buildings and sometimes they're operating in 19 buildings because buildings get shuttered because things are cyclical. That would be the wide range. Mr. Shea's a little different because your company historically has dealt more with FEMA. Uh, has it always been a significant, as opposed to, Mr. Legal, was it about 5% of yours? Is that what the trade Correct. is? Uh, Mr. Shea, what percent of, of FEMA uh, would be a, a standard and what's your range in Nap Napanee, the Aetna Green facilities tend to be extra cyclical. Could you kind of give an idea of how you go up and down because of the nature of your business is somewhat different than some of the others? Well, so, some years we provided 500 units to FEMA. Some years we provided 14,000 units to FEMA for hurricane relief. This was the largest number we'd, we'd ever produced. And um, you know, obviously since that time the industry's uh, gone downward in terms of its overall production. We've had to adjust to that. This is going to be a very difficult year for the industry. I've, I've heard five or six companies already go out of business, long-term companies, and some of the industry segments are down 56 percent. So we do have to make that kind of adjustment, but our utmost thing is to try to preserve manufacturing jobs Mr. and do everything Jones, we can, can to do that. Just a quick follow-up to that. 2,000 figure was used. What would be the range of your employment? It could range between one and two thousand. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Thank the chairman. Uh, I want to thank the panel too for coming. I, I represent the fourth district of uh, Ohio. We have um, Airstream, part of the Thor industry as well, in our in our district. Norcold, which I assume is a supplier for for some of you guys. Um, so we we do appreciate you being here in, in, in your industry. I thought. Mr. Ice did, did a nice summary when we talked about the standards. You know, you talked about there's no test, there's no standard. And in fact, the, the, in the previous panel, um, Dr. McGee even said that, I think if I got his quote right, the CDC is not, in a, not a standard setting agency. So there's, you know, it's, it's a tough situation that you guys are, uh, have happened to deal with here. But I wanted to go to, uh, I think Mr. Legal had referenced, I didn't catch all your opening statements, but Mr. Legal in his opening statement uh, talked about his assistance to um, FEMA in past disasters. Um, and I know uh, Mr. Shea as well with Gulfstream has done that. Have, have, have the Mr. Uh, Bennett and Mr. Finnick, have you guys also assisted FEMA in, in past hurricanes or past disasters? We've never had a contract with FEMA, no. There's been some products that we've supplied, but it's been through the dealers. Would you push the button on your mic, please? <laughs> it is on. Can you okay. <laughs> that help? A little closer. And Mr. Bennett? Uh, we've never had a contract directly with FEMA. Okay, so just, just Gulfstream and, and Forest River. And <coughs> in your past dealings with uh, FEMA, has there ever been problems? Have you had any complaints? Has, has, has things, things gone fine? Could I uh, go back? We did not have a direct contract with FEMA. You sold off your lots? No. We sold to uh, uh, American Catastrophe, which was a approved supplier. Okay. And, and so, I mean, it wasn't a direct with deal with FEMA. Okay. But in your past dealings where, where your units have uh, assisted FEMA in dealing with disaster relief, have there, have there been any problems with, with those units? In the past, absolutely none. And Mr. Shea? We've had a very excellent relationship with FEMA over the years. We've got, we have laudatory rec, uh, re, uh, letters relative to our performance. And we've worked closely with them. And the units that were now now with Katrina and, and Hurricane Rita, the, the, the units that were sold there, is it, is it accurate to say they were the exact same units that you would send to your dealers and your dealers would sell to any citizen or any family who came to, to purchase those? Mr. Yes, uh, Mr. Lee. Very definitely. Very Answered definitely. yet. Mr. Shea, same, same, same units? We were the only uh, manufacturer that was approved for rail transport, uh, which was important to FEMA. And I think they shipped about 25,000 of our units by rail. So our units do have differences beyond what would be normal for our regular production. There are some differences, but all the products use composite wood products like particle board and MDF and hardwood plywood. I mean, that's very much the same for, for all of them. And then uh, Mr. Bennett, Mr. Finnick, same units that you, that were part of Katrina, the same units you'd sell to any other customer? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Mr. Chairman, that's uh, yield back to balance my time. Thank you very much. Uh, that concludes the questioning uh, by the members of the committee, and I do want to recognize Mr. Donnelly at this point. I want to thank the chairman again for uh, having the grace to let me be present at this hearing, and I want to welcome all of the gentlemen here uh, for participating. 
uh, there are headquarters located in our district. You have facilities located in our, in our district. And I think the, the other story that is here is a story of the number of families of the Gulf Coast region who were able to receive shelter from your products when they had nowhere else to put their head at night. And who, because of the workers of your companies, were able to have their family have a place to stay and be able to shower and to eat and have somewhere that they could put their family unit back together. And that the workers of your company, the other untold story is the overtime work that was put in on a constant basis, the weekend work that was done because of the commitment of your workers and your companies to the people who lived, their fellow Americans down in the Gulf region. I travel the highways of our district, as you know, and day after day, almost every two or three minutes, you could see another unit heading down to the Gulf region for another family. And so the one question I have is for you, Mr. Shea, and that is that the government and scientific agencies have not seemed to be able to successfully come to a consensus as to a formaldehyde level for your products. In that absence, uh, are you voluntarily implementing any standards and what would they be? Yes, Congressman. We uh, moved uh, in spring of 2007 we started implementing uh, products that were equivalent to the upcoming CARB standards uh, for product emissions that go into effect in 2009. And beyond that, we've moved now to actually 2011 compliant products. So what we're producing now is two and a half years in front of the marketplace, as far as I know. And that's where we like to be. We like to be ahead of the curve. We've been ahead of the curve in terms of using LFE products starting in the 90s. And uh, we also, to my knowledge, are the only manufacturer who has a third party uh, organization that ensures our, our uh, material acquisition, our supply processes, and does ventilation, uh, uh, verification testing on products that we receive from vendors. Thank you very much. I have no other questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Donnelly. Uh, some members wish a second round, and I see that Mr. Welch just arrived. He hasn't done his first round, but let, let me uh, recognize myself, and then we'll um, get to Mr. Welch down the road. Uh, la last week, CDC issued its report, and we heard from CDC this morning in their testimony, and they said to us that uh, levels of formaldehyde uh, were elevated in these trailers and some exceeded 500 parts per billion, which is the level that OSHA requires mandatory medical monitoring. It's that, it's that high, so that they require medical monitoring. As a result of its testing, CDC recommended everyone currently living in these trailers be evacuated immediately, not just some residents, but all of them. CDC said that government should prioritize this evacua evacuation first to take out the elderly and children, those who are most sensitive, can, uh, but then uh, to eventually get everybody out. Uh, the witnesses on this panel that's before us right now, representing the companies that sold these trailers, I'd like to ask each of you, uh, do you agree that the federal government uh, should, uh, do you agree with this federal government decision to evacuate these residents from your trailers if, um, if, if they exceed this 500 parts uh, per billion? Mr. Shea, do you agree with that statement from CDC and recommendation? The CDC recommended that these persons be quickly relocated despite the levels. The levels were as low as three parts per billion, sir, and they ranged upwards. No, no, that's not my question. My question is, we're being told that if people are living in trailers that exceed 500 parts per billion, that they be, re <laughs> they be uh, put into some other trailer, that they be relocated. Do you disagree with that? I think that there should be all consideration for the safety of the, of the persons. There are some statistical outlookers. There's very few of the units that I know were that, at that level. They average But if they're at that level, do you agree with that recommendation? Yes or no? Above that level, 
with the concerns that have been registered by the CDC, I would agree for public health. Okay. How about you, Mr. Bennett? I would agree. And Mr. Fennick? I think that there are really some unusual circumstances in Louisiana, and absolutely. I mean, if it's unsafe, they should be moved out. Mr. Legal? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, um, since you agree with this statement, let me ask you this. Why should the federal government have to pay you for these trailers? Uh, the American taxpayers spent $2 billion in trailers that can't be used. Shouldn't we get that money back if those trailers exceed that very high level? I don't see any of you jumping in to say yes. Yeah, Mr. I, would, I would answer that question, sir. The CDC testing totally depends on use. Anybody that would have smoked a cigarette or otherwise used the unit, it wasn't a protocol that was universal. They were totally dependent on what people did, whether they cooked fish, whether they smoked a cigarette, whether they did other things that raised these levels higher. We're in favor not just of a standard, but we're, we need also a, a protocol of testing to follow so that we know what we're comparing let me, uh, to. Let me interrupt you. Two years ago, you tested trailers and found that 40 percent of them exceeded that uh, level. Uh, Mr. Fennick, uh, CDC found that a trailer from your company, Keystone RV, had formaldehyde exposures of 480 parts per billion. Do you think that that's uh, safe? <clears throat> you know, I based on the information that we're hearing today, you know, you would say that no, that doesn't sound like it's a okay. safe level. However, please let me complete my thought if I might. Um, but the implication then is that it's all the, the result of the way the trailer was built, and that I don't agree with, okay. to answer your question about the so you, But you don't think it's safe? Well, now, I'm let not me a ask scientist. Mr. Uh, Bennett the question. Uh, uh, CDC found that a trailer from your company, Pilgrim International, had 520 parts per billion. Do you think that's safe for people to live, live in? I would have to state that, you know, this is long after the fact, and uh, at, the, at the time we built these units, we had no standard to go by. We were building them the same way we built trailers, thousands of trailers. We had no reason to believe that these trailers were not okay, safe. But you don't think it's safe now? Mr. Shea, uh, you're the chairman of, the, of Gulfstream Company. You provided the most trailers to FEMA. Your company was paid over a half a billion dollars. CDC found that one of your trailers had formaldehyde levels of 590, the highest level of any of the trailers that it examined. The point that I'm getting to is I don't think that a manufacturer of any product should say, well, if there's no standard, I don't have to meet it. I think you have an obligation to try to find out if your product is going to harm people. I think that's just the, the responsibility of any manufacturer that sells a product, no matter what it is, whether it's a, a, a toy or a trailer. And um, when we hear from CDC that everyone living in these trailers at that level should be evacuated as soon as possible, uh, nobody should live in those trailers with formaldehyde that high. It sounds like the companies who sold these trailers uh, are, not, are not willing to say that they have some responsibility because there was no standard. I just don't accept that argument. My, my time has expired. Uh, who, who wishes to be uh, recognized? Mr. Mr. Bilbray? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, I'm, this whole issue sort of is interesting how it's come around. As the chairman knows, I served on the Air Resources Board in California, and we were, had major concerns about indoor pollution exposures. Um, in fact, as far as I know right now, we were 90s, we were looking at a different exposure, and that was the exposure caused by formaldehyde emissions from new purchased vehicles, new manufactured vehicles. Um, I question, does anybody know what the formaldehyde exposure is? on a new automobile in the United States left in the noonday sun for a few hours? And is there a federal standard of maximum exposure for new automobiles? I would say, as far as I know, no, there isn't. And it is a concern and has been a concern of the Air Resources Board since, since the late 80s. Um, but do we hold automobile manufacturers responsible for that exposure? And do we now open up uh, the issue that automobile manufacturers should be 
held accountable for any exposure over a certain limit um, to new car dealers and uh, new car purchasers because I haven't bought a new car in a long time and frankly that new car smell is something that people talk about <clears throat> but at the Air Resources Board we were addressing it. My question is this, the formaldehyde emissions in these trailers and in my family, I was in Mississippi, I had a family home damage in Mississippi and I saw the trailers coming in. The manufacturing products that were put in these trailers, are they products that are available in the open market at any Home Depot, at any lumber yard, or are these unique particle board and materials that are emitting formaldehyde? Gentlemen? I'd be happy to answer that. It is off the shelf, standard stuff that's used every day in house building for all intent and purposes. Maybe we might get a different thickness of a material versus the standard, you know, half inch versus we might get three eighths, but it is off the shelf material. Anyone knows when the testing was done, was the units, were they, um, was there any mitigation done to new construction exposed to the southern sun for basically caused more aggravated emissions coming out of these particle board and other products, just like the new automobile left in the sun. Is there, in these records, what kind of application, how old were the units, and um, what was the parameters in with which the tests were made that came up with these high numbers? you guys have any idea of what kind of parameters the Sierra Club used in doing these testing? Excuse me? Well, I, uh, the data I had was that the Sierra Club felt there was evaluations and concerns about the exposure, Mr. Chairman. Am, am I wrong on that? The Sierra Club didn't have any? No, I, 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 I'm misinformed and I'm sorry to uh, have uh, jumped in. I guess the Sierra Club did some very preliminary early studies. So. And raised the concerns? Yes. And my... So the gentleman's question is based on a, an accurate statement. They, uh, there, was, there was tests done by the Sierra Club and raised these concerns. And the testing done... Um, the big question is there is that do we now go, go to all construction material and start addressing the issue of formaldehyde in all construction material and is that the way we could reduce this exposure? Basically say particle board may be outlawed in the United States or may not be used in construction where you have in, in um, the potential well, the for indoor pollution which is AR, ARB in California has been talking about for over a decade. Go ahead sir. Yes, ARB is implementing, as I mentioned earlier uh, in 2009, <clears throat> new product standards, which they say are the most stringent in the world. And yes, these, uh, if there is going to be standards, certainly for our industry uh, in using these common wood products, they need to be applied to home building, remodeling, apartments, uh, furniture. Everyone needs to be on the same because it's more difficult to ensure what product you're getting when there's all kinds of different products out there. So it would be helpful to have a national standard for these kinds of products. Okay. And then remember, too, that the use of this particle board has actually been encouraged through the recycling of waste products from lumber activity so that um, waste products that would normally have been burned or thrown away are now recycled and put into and um, this, this um, stream to be able to um, use it as construction material rather than using virgin material and going down and cutting them more, down more trees. Was that fair to say that this is how we ended up with so much particle board? Yes, sir. The, there's a, a product that came into play after, well after this, um, our products were created. It's called environmentally preferable product and it has uh, special standards and they're low formaldehyde, but to be an environmentally preferable product, it has to be a sustainable product and taken from the kinds of products you're talking about. So, you know, in a lot of ways, it's a green product. Mr. Chairman, I just ask that when we look for a minimum standard here for exposure in a travel trailer, which um, really does not apply to the mobile home because the, the exposure rate was assumed to be different. And I think there's a legitimate argument there that maybe we need to look at our own regs. Um, uh, but again, just as we did with implants, um, medical implants and stuff, there's really got to be a line drawn here of what's the exposure um, or what's the responsibility of one person as opposed to another and where the source of the formaldehyde came from and was it reasonable for somebody to feel that generally 
available construction material that is used universally across the construction um, industries in many different fields was somehow not, a, not appropriate at this location. I think that's a debate, but I think there's a degree of uh, backseat driving here, hindsight 2020, that it's not a trailer that um, was newly constructed that was in Minnesota during the winter where there might not have been any exposure at all. It happened to be a brand new trailer that was produced and then put into the sun in Mississippi and Louisiana in the middle of August, which really changes the whole dynamics there. Um, that real life application is something that we know now, postscript, but to perceive that that was going to be a problem somewhere in the future, I think is, is you know, really um, second guessing people to an extreme especially the fact that I still would say why are new automobiles exempt from the environmental air pollution exemption except for the fact that they are in the same clause here and I say publicly um, if you own a new car don't jump into it after it has been sitting in the sun. Roll the windows down and let it air out unless you want to get a good dose of formaldehyde and that is something that I think that the consumers need to talk about back and forth but we ought to be talking about that um, before the incident rather than coming back now and pointing fingers after the incident. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Bilbray. Mr. Welch. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Shea, I, I want to ask you a little bit about uh, CNN, a CNN story. Uh, in April of 2006, I understand that Gulfstream became aware that CNN was going to be doing a story on formaldehyde in FEMA trailers. You, you're familiar with that? Yes, I recollect that, sir. And, well, it was a big deal. Uh, this was going to go to the heart of the quality of the trailers and whether people in your trailers were getting sick, right? Sir, I, I expressed earlier, I don't know if you were here, the experiences that we had with several complainants. Well, let me just add, let me proceed here. I, I'm just trying, I'm saying the obvious here. As a company, you obviously want to defend the product that you put out, right? If there's going to be a story raising questions about it, you're going to take that story seriously and prepare for it, right? We, we, we took, as soon as this, uh, the initial story came out in Bay St. Louis in mid-March, we, we were very much uh, concerned and, uh, with the story and the issue, certainly. All right. So Gulfstream, your company, uh, sent a statement to CNN in April 2006 about formaldehyde. Uh, and I want to quote from a portion of that where it said, and I quote, I'll put this up on the board if we can, we are not aware of any complaints of illness from our many customers of Cavalier travel trailers over the years, including travel trailers provided under our contracts with FEMA. Uh, did your company make that statement? And we were speaking retrospectively prior to the March uh, issue in the, when it started in, in March. We were talking about our experience in, with Florida hurricanes and we had been building these since 1992, if you recall. Did your company make that statement? We did make that statement. And did yes, you sir. make it in April of 2006? It was made in April of 2006. All right. So is it fair to, to, to conclude that any listener would hear your statement as asserting that your company was aware of no complaints prior to the issuance of that statement. Our intent with the statement was to describe our history of, of experience with this prior to this issue becoming about in, from Bay St. Louis in mid-March. So that was our intent, sir. So it, it, let's, let's use English here. You made a statement on April and as of that date I assume that you vouch for the integrity of the statement. Well, sir, there were allegations I, we're not even familiar with the medical aspects of any of these, these uh, complaints. So what you meant to say is that you are on a, you are unaware of any substantiated medical complaints. We're unaware of any, um, we're aware of allegations, we are unaware of substantiated medical complaints and we were speaking prior to so why, our, if, our prior, if, previous experience in previous years, sir. So. Why didn't you say you were heard of allegations but not, quote, substantiated medical complaints? Sir, we were trying to be as expressive of our history of, of dealing with this and we thought that was what was important. But we were addressing the few complaints that we received, sir, and the record shows it. 
What? In that period, we had. Well, let me let me ask you what let me tell you what the record does show. In March 20 of 2006, uh, on your Gulfstream interactive uh, website, you received a statement. You Gulfstream. And this is before you issued the no complaint uh, 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 statement. And I'll quote, and I think we can get that up here as well. There is an odor in my trailer that will not go away. It burns my eyes, and I am getting headaches every day. I have tried many things, but nothing seems to work. Please, please help me. Now, were you able to say that you would receive no complaints because this did not come with a medical certificate? Every complaint that we received, sir, we investigated, we responded to, we, we asked persons if we could assist well, them. Know, that's not the question I'm asking. I mean, I, I asked you how you square that statement. Your, CNN, your statement to CNN, quote, we are not aware of any complaints of illness, you made that in April of 2006, with a statement from a customer on a website that was a complaint. Sir, we, had, we received three complaints during that period. We addressed all of them. We are proactive on them. We asked FEMA to assist on any complaints Let's, they had. And we were... You know, I, I don't want to be difficult. We, but I don't, I don't want to be, be difficult, difficult either, sir. Had you received any complaints before April 2006 when you issued your statement to CNN that you had no complaints? The re the complaints re related to this matter that we received were two so in that period. The answer, to, the answer to my question is yes. You had received complaints prior to April, but you told CNN you had no complaints, correct? And we were speaking of our history with FEMA as a program, sir. And that's, well, that's a convenient way of saying that's the justification for saying something that was untrue. Sir, I, I believe we've been very truthful in everything that we've done and, and what we presented here today. I'll yield the balance of my time. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Legal, I think I'll, uh, I'll, I'll switch to you and give Mr. Shea a little bit of a break here. Uh, the Chairman earlier was talking in terms of, you know, shouldn't people get their money back, shouldn't the government not pay, and, and so on. And, and, I, and I'd like to set the record straight as, a, as having been a manufacturer myself. Uh, all of your companies, but I'll ask you to answer for anyone unless they want to pipe in particularly, all of your companies are subject to various state uh, lemon laws, right? Yes, sir. Plus you all have networks of, of dealer distributors, right? Yes. Correct. Now, if a customer is dissatisfied, and particularly if the customer either litigates or comes in with multiple valid complaints, uh, if, if the dealer, the distributor see, sees a problem, they're going to call you up and say, take this lemon back, re repair or replace it, correct? That's, yes. a, that's correct. Okay, so the industry you're in, including the trade association norms for this industry, say if you make a product which is substantially defective, such as, uh, you know, well, it was on the, the, the trip to its destination, somebody let it get soaked in water, or, or anything else that causes it to be materially different than the 10,000 other ones produced this, the same year, you take them back, you repair, replace them, you make them right. Is that correct? That is correct. And that's true of most of the sort of the Elkhart uh, uh, group, uh, if you will, of travel trailer makers. So when FEMA started having these problems, was there any doubt in any of your mind that if any of your trailers had material workmanship or uh, material or workmanship failures in your design or in the materials you chose or in the work that your people did, that you would make it right by repairing or replacing it? Was there any doubt in your mind that you would do that? I believe we would have. Okay. Has FEMA ever come to you and said, take back this trailer, it's defective in work that you did? No, sir, never. Okay. Now, you have evaluated trailers that had a myriad of problems uh, uh, that had been used and, and, you know, you were part of that evaluation of why does it have this level or why did mold produce and so on. So you're familiar with some trailers that got a year or two down the road and have problems, right? Correct. Okay. So you've cooperated with FEMA, the government agency that you sold to. Uh, you would take back the products if they were defective in material or workmanship. And in fact, you've not been asked to, nor have you been given a failure uh, of any part of your spec or your material workmanship. Is that correct? If it was our problem, we definitely would stand behind okay. it. Okay. And, and I'd like just a nod. All the rest of you agree? Yes. yes. So 
the norm in the industry, particularly when you're making something that feeds into state la la uh, lemon laws and so on as these things do, the norm is you make it right, you use your distributor network, your dealer networks to make it right if it's in the field without bringing it back. And in fact, even though we're having this hearing today and we're talking about this people suffering and so on, which I, I'm not disputing that people have had health problems while living in these trailers, but in no way, shape, or form has the government come to you and said you did this wrong as of today. No allegations against any of the four of you other than what you heard from the dais, dais here today. Correct. Correct. Okay. I think that makes, Mr. Chairman, I think that makes the case that these are not the wrongdoers. Government may very well have failed the people of Louisiana and Mississippi. Uh, they may be continuing to fail them by not setting standards for the uh, tra travel trailers or living accommodation, by not having ongoing testing. That may all be very true. And certainly, uh, as a Californian, you and I share uh, the leading edge of air quality that California is known for. But none of that is here today. So I'm not defending anyone, but I'd like to thank all four of you for coming here today, for testifying honestly, and in fact for the the fact that nothing has been said here that causes you to have done anything wrong. Now, you may have tested and come up with high or low or different levels, but again, as we heard from the CDC, these are all things we'd like to do, but government as of today hasn't done it. So, Mr. Chairman, since we're the Government of, uh, Oversight and Reform Committee, now that we've I think completed most of our oversight, I would hope that we would join on a bipartisan basis to do the reform of making sure that the government agencies responsible for air quality, however, it, whether it's in manufactured items or in the air itself, do their job and set appropriate standards and testing procedures so that we don't again haul in four CEOs of companies who as of today have not had one product returned as defective or in somehow inappropriate to design and rather make sure that we have standards for the next one so that these four will competitively bid on a product that would be improved once we decide what improved means. So, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for holding this hearing, but I do very strongly hope that on a bipartisan basis we will do that second leg and ensure that we set standards that people can manufacture to. And with that, I thank you and yield back. Thank, thank you, Mr. Issa. I want to ask uh, Mr. Burton and Mr. Souter, do you wish to have a second round? Yes, I want Okay, to. Mr. Burton. I want to read to you uh, what it says regarding the parts per billion and, and what HUD sets as a target. It says HUD set a target of 400 parts per billion for indoor ambient air in manufactured homes. HUD's indoor ambient air target guideline of 400 uh, parts per billion is based on component standards for plywood and particle board. In the unoccupied units testing revealed baseline formaldehyde levels were at 1,040 parts per billion but fell to an average of 390 when the air conditioner was turned on. The averages fell even lower to 90 parts per billion, per, per billion when the windows were open. The baseline average is probably attributable to the fact that unoccupied trailers were sealed up, sealed up in storage, they were in the sun and had little or no air conditioning or exiting. In all occupied units, the average, the average level was 77 parts per billion and 81 parts per billion for travel trailers specifically. I, I, I kind of am disappointed that we have you four here beating up on you because I don't think you've done anything wrong. You've used standard materials off the shelf that's used in any kind of home construction or remodeling. I've had it done in my house. The location of the mobile homes in question was in an area that was extremely hot. They were sealed up and nobody was in them and so when somebody went in them obviously the parts per billion would be much much higher and it would take a while for them to cool off and if they didn't open the windows it would probably take even longer for them to get all the parts per billion down to where they should be and then you have to take into consideration how the occupants lived if they had a dog in the house if they bought additional furniture or different kinds of other things in that might have formaldehyde in them did they smoke how did they cook did they like higher temperatures in their house or lower temperatures in their house? There's all kinds of uh, uh, imponderables that you have to take into consideration when you're talking about the parts per billion. And, and, and you know, in all of our houses, we have carpet, we have furniture, we have construction material that you use in your, your, your products. And I'm going to go home and try to find out how much I've got in my house. And I'm gonna, when I exercise downstairs where I have it all closed up, I'm going to open the doors because I'm concerned about my health. 
I, I just think, you know, there's 8 million of these units in use around the country. Very, very few complaints, if any. And, and I just think for us to call you in here and pound on you and, con and infirm that you're lying about your products and everything, I think it's just uh, unconscionable. And I want to thank you for being here, for being so forthright, and for providing an industry that helps people when they're in need and suffering like they did in Florida during the hurricanes and like they've done in places like uh, Katrina in the south uh, on the Gulf. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, the chairman has the right to call a hearing on almost anything, but uh, I'm disappointed in, in much of the uh, questioning that's gone on today because it questions your integrity, and I don't think it should have been done and without a yield back. Mr. Souter. Is Mr. Welch going to ask any more questions? Why don't you just go ahead and take well, your second uh, round? Well, I, I would like to hear what other questions are before. I, I know the chairman has a right to summarize, but if Mr. Welch has additional questions, I'd like to uh, reserve. Let me ask you this. Do you want, if I make a concluding statement, do you want to make a concluding oh, I, statement? I, I, you get to make the concluding I wondered if Mr. Welch had another round. And do you wish to be recognized at this time? No. Okay. Oh, okay. No, I'll just make my Thank comments. You. So we'll both make concluding statements? Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay, well, I think. Oh, uh, what, do you want me to go first? I mean, I. Whichever you, whatever you want. Well, you're the chairman. You have a right to summarize. I just wanted to see whether uh, you were going well, to Why don't you wait and hear what I have to say, okay. and then you'll have the last, last word about the whole thing. Sure. Uh, first of all, I want to ask unanimous consent that uh, the staffs have discussed the release of documents and have reached a mutual understanding. And so I ask unanimous consent that the, these documents be part of the record. Uh, reserving the right to object, I merely want to say that while I have some concerns, I really appreciate the majority working with us, and I uh, withdraw my objection. Okay, thank you. Um, this is our second hearing on this issue of uh, formaldehyde in these trailers. And I thought it was the second hearing of the Congress, but it, it turned out that during the course of today's hearing, we got a phone call. And that phone call was from a staff person who worked for this committee in 1981. And he told us there was a hearing at that time on the question of formaldehyde in trailers. And at that time, at the conclusion of the hearing, the members of Congress said to the uh, FEMA and to HUD and to the Consumer Product Safety Commission and OSHA, they ought to set a standard. They ought to set a standard for uh, formaldehyde levels in trailers. That was 1981. So I agree with my Republican colleagues when they say this is a failure of government. Government should have set standards. Government should have protected the public from the dangers from formaldehyde, and the government failed. But I also think this is a failure of industry, because some of you did testing, and you found that there was a problem, and then that was the end of it. We didn't hear anything more. Some of you didn't want to test at all, even though reports were coming out in the press about high formaldehyde levels in trailers causing people to be sick. Now, I do want everyone to understand, when we heard about the fellow who said, I, the smell is too bad, come and help me, I'm wheezing and having all sorts of medical problems or symptoms, please, please, please help me. That was rare. Most people don't, don't smell anything. But suddenly they have symptoms. They don't go to the manufacturer and say, I've got symptoms, take your trailer back. They don't even know what's causing it. So government should know what's causing it because it's well established that formaldehyde can cause these symptoms. And I believe industry has a responsibility as well to know that if they're, if they're selling this product that it may cause health problems to those who are buying it. Uh, testing by uh, Mr. Shea's company showed high levels. Some of these levels were far above even the highest standard where there was a regulatory standard. They were in the hundreds and, and thousands of parts per uh, billion. And I think a manufacturer knowing this information had an obligation to make the product safer and to understand that perhaps there was a problem that needed to be corrected. I think the rest of you also had an obligation to do some testing, not to act as if, if, not, if you didn't know, therefore there's nothing required of you. Now, I'm pleased that the four of you are in business. I'm pleased that you have employees that have jobs with you. I'm pleased that you have members of Congress from 
your area that uh, will vouch for you personally. Uh, I, I think you're entitled to uh, make your profits and uh, even even the, the double of your doubling of your salary in those two years when you had the FEMA contract, Mr. Shea, for you and your, I think it was your brother, you're entitled to that. I don't begrudge any of that. I want you to be in business. But I think that when we have to abandon trailers, that it's not just the government that should pay for it. I think there's some responsibility for the manufacturers as well, because these levels should have been uh, of concern. Um, I know that some members have acted like you're victims because you're simply asked to come here and answer questions. I think that, they, that um, those who really suffered were the people who are getting sick from formaldehyde in these trailers. Uh, I think they're victims of FEMA's incompetence. They were victims of manufacturers who didn't disclose what they knew about the formaldehyde dangers as well. And we'll uh, see where uh, all of this goes. I'm willing to to, to entertain ideas for legislation. That's the purpose of oversight hearings, but also to get to find out what really happened. And I think that uh, what happened is a disgrace on the part of the government particularly, but is not an exoneration uh, for the manufacturers who knew or should have known, or in fact did know, uh, that the trailers uh, were not safe for those who were inhabiting them. And now the taxpayers have to be stuck with the bill. So those are my concluding comments. I thank you all for being here voluntarily and cooperating with us. I think that's uh, uh, to your credit. Now, uh, any comments you want to make uh, to close off the hearing? I thank the chairman for his uh, generosity. I wasn't trying to have the last uh, views. Uh, but I, I appreciate that because this industry is really critical to my district as well as uh, to Mr. Donnelly's. I was at the Goshen Air Show Saturday. and just people kept coming up. Do you think we're going to get our jobs back? Uh, we really want to work. They, they love working in this industry. We need to keep this industry going. They worked hard to meet the emergency demand. We, we clearly um, today have, have kind of confused all sorts of things, but basically nobody wants to defend somebody getting sick. The, the challenge here is, is there is uh, no evidence, even though it's a carcinogenic, at this point of beyond basically itching, coughing, wheezing type things. This may be like peanuts. Different people have allergic reactions. That clearly we need to be moving towards some sort of a warning st standard as we do this research that different people react differently to this. That's a very minimal that, that uh, should be there. That uh, HUD had a standard. They met the standard as far as they knew. Questions came up and a company volunteered to try to test even though FEMA could have done those tests, even though FEMA was at the plant from morning to afternoon, the test was not prohibitively expensive. The company tried to engage FEMA, and FEMA wasn't interested. The incredible, justified negative publicity about the government's handling of Katrina and FEMA has now resulted in an overreaction to, I think it's 16 parts, which is not achievable for emergency housing. I want to reiterate again that the 390 that was tested scientifically, not by the type of, of uh, formaldehyde meter, but scientifically to the, the gold standard. Um, in Louisiana, in southern Louisiana, trying to convert the 6.6 uh, milligrams per meter, which is their high point, appears to convert to 4,000 parts per billion for the highest of a site-built house in the region. This isn't a question just of manufactured housing, of travel trailers. It's a fundamental question about the materials, how they interact by region, and we need to have a scientific approach to this. And it, given the fact that we do not have that evidence of how much is even in the particular wood here versus in other homes in that region, given the ambient air standard on the Hancock study, which itself was not uh, uh, precisely the, the same type of thing, it is, is my belief unfair to suggest that the manufacturers bear responsibility when the science is at very least very conflicted and it's not clear that every home in the region isn't hitting, uh, certainly if 390 is the mean, that means uh, of the average, that a significant percentage of every house 
in, in at least uh, given the, what we know now in Louisiana doesn't meet this standard and we aren't asking for all our HUD houses to be back, private owners aren't asking to be back. And that's been my concern with this industry, not that we shouldn't be trying to learn the danger to individuals. And I look forward to working with the chairman in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Souter. Thanks for all the witnesses' participation. That concludes our hearing and we stand adjourned. Watching public affairs programming on C-SPAN.